to begin the trial after a brief pick yesterday. We just wanted to deal with a few issues this morning. Um, I think this came up off the record, maybe on the record. I'm not 100% sure. I think it's off the record, though. We talked about admissibility of the defendant's um, investigative subpoena testimony. Uh, Mr. Kirkhoff said he thought that was inadmissible. I preliminarily commented, I didn't make a definitive ruling, I thought it probably was a party admission, and I asked counsel to follow up on that if they had any information or case law that might uh, support uh, my initial impression or refute it. And uh, then we got an email uh, yesterday from the prosecutor's office citing People versus Seals, 285 Michigan 1, 2009 case, which was strongly suggested that uh, investigative subpoena uh, testimony is admissible, admissible under the circumstances. However, I believe Mr. Kirkhoff wanted to make a statement about this regardless. Go ahead, Mr. Kirkhoff. I would still object to what I did ch have a chance to read that case and uh, how the Court of Appeals can say uh, that somebody uh, is not compelled to testify under an investigative subpoena when they are threatened with going to jail unless they testify. How that is not being compelled is beyond my belief. <laughs> okay. You understand that, however, it is a uh, binding opinion, uh, published opinion, therefore I have to follow. You understand that? I understand that. that. Did you, do you see any distinction between these facts and the facts in the opinion no. of any substance? No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Faber, any comments about this matter? Just one point of clarification regarding the rights, Your Honor. And I was the prosecutor that did the investigative subpoena interview of the defendant. The defendant did have an attorney present uh, that the court provided, Robert Mirkay. The rights that were read pursuant to statute do give the defendant the right to refuse to answer questions. The, the investigative subpoena statute requires the following right to be read. You are allowed to lawfully refuse to answer any question where a truthful answer to the question would incriminate you yourself. I have done hundreds of these investigative subpoena interviews a number of times uh, because the, the witness believes that uh, he or she will provide an incriminating statement, they refuse to uh, they refuse to conduct the interview, and there is no legal recourse because of that constitutional right. Uh, that right was afforded to the defendant. The defendant, with it, with counsel present, waived that right and agreed to answer questions. All right, very good, thank you. All right, again, I had an initial impression that uh, the uh, defendant's uh, investigative subpoena testimony uh, was admissible as substantive evidence during the prosecutor's. Uh, a case in chief. Um, I think my initial impression was correct, and I think it's bolstered by uh, the prosecutor's statements as well as uh, people versus seal. So uh, it shall be admitted. Um, the next thing we're going to deal with is that before we talk about the instructions, is uh, Miss uh, Prevet in my office with Mr. Kirkhoff present brought up an issue with respect to certain statements made by perhaps a two or three year old, two or three year old children of the alleged victim here, and sought to exclude them. Uh, so make a statement about that, Ms. Corbett. I don't think Mr. Kirchhoff has any objection, but go ahead. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, there were some uh, brief statements made by the two-year-old and three-year-old, which, as the court pointed out, were the children of the named victim in this case. Um, I brought it up to the court that I would do a motion to exclude those statements, that um, the children were not competent as witnesses based on their age. Um, they were not, I don't believe they were forensically interviewed, and some of the statements they gave do not match up to the physical evidence on the scene. Um, so I would be moving to exclude any reference to those. And I believe Mr. Kirkhoff agrees with that. Mr. Kirkhoff, any statement regarding that? I had not planned on getting any of those statements. Okay. Well, at this point, I'll exclude them. If you think that somehow they should be admitted somehow during the trial, if things change, Mr. Kirkhoff, you shall request a sidebar to deal with that, and we'll hash it out, okay? Yes. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, finally, um, we discussed preliminary jury instructions, uh, and... Um, my understanding is there's no objection to the instructions or what's being disseminated to the jury. Is that right, uh, Ms. Corbett? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Kirkhoff? Yes, Your Honor. All right, with that, I think we can bring the jury out. Do we have the jury instructions? I didn't. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sure. Let me look at it just a minute. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to proceed. Why don't we go get the jury at this time? Thank you.
very cool. instruct uh, you know, a couple things. Uh, there's a camera here today. Uh, during these proceedings, first of all, the camera will not be on any jurors. They will not film you at all. They're so instructed not to film the jurors in any way, shape, or form. In addition, uh, this kind of emphasizes one of the points I'll read in a minute. So it looks like there may be some media attention in this case. Obviously, do not argue any media attention during the course of these proceedings. You have to decide the case based on the evidence uh, in the courtroom. Uh, I'm going to start out this morning with some preliminary instructions uh, that will kind of tell you about the trial procedure and how we're going to proceed, okay? Now I'll explain some of the legal principles you'll need to know and the procedure we'll follow in this trial. The trial follows this procedure. First, the prosecutor makes an opening statement where she gives her theories about the case. The defendant's lawyer does not have to make an opening statement, but he may, wait, he may make an opening statement after the prosecutor makes his, or he may wait until later. These statements are not evidence. They're only meant to help you understand how each side used the case. Next, the prosecutor presents her evidence. The prosecutor may call witnesses to testify and may show you exhibits like documents or objects. The defense lawyer has the right to cross-examine the prosecution's witnesses. After the prosecutor has presented all her evidence, the defense attorney may also offer evidence, but does not have to. By law, the defendant does not have to prove his innocence or produce any evidence. If the defense does, if the defense does call any witnesses, the prosecutor has the right to cross-examine them the prosecutor may also call witnesses to contradict, to, to contradict the testimony of the defense witnesses. After all the evidence has been presented, the prosecutor and the defendant's lawyer will make their closing arguments. Like the opening statements, these are not evidence. They're only meant to help you understand the evidence and the way each side sees the case. You must base your verdict only on the evidence. In a few minutes, you will be given a copy of some written instructions. Uh, you may refer to them during the trial. Since no one can predict the course of the trial, these instructions may change or at the end of the trial. At the close of the trial, I will provide you a copy of my final instructions for you to use during your deliberations. My responsibility is as the judge in this trial to make sure that the trial is run fairly efficiently, to make decisions about evidence, and to instruct you about the law that applies to this case. You must take the law as I give it to you. Nothing I say is meant to reflect my own opinions about the facts of the case. As jurors, you are the only ones who will decide this case. Your responsibility as jurors is to decide what the facts of the case are. This is your job and no one else's. You must think about all the evidence and all the testimony and then decide what each piece of evidence means and how important you think it is. This includes how much you believe what each of the witnesses said. What you decide about any fact in this case is final. When it's time for you to decide the, the case, you're only allowed to consider the evidence that was admitted in the case. Evidence includes only the sworn testimony of the witnesses, the exhibits admitted to the evidence, and anything else I tell you to consider as evidence. It's your job to decide what the facts of this case are. You must decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think your testimony is. You do not have to accept or, or reject everything a witness said or says. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. However, in deciding whether you believe a witness's testimony, you must set aside any bias or prejudice you have based on race, gender, or national origin of the witness. There's no fixed set of... Uh, there is no fixed set of rules for judging whether you believe a witness, but you may, it may help you to think about these questions. Was the witness able to see or hear clearly? How long was the witness watching or listening? Was anything else going on that may have distracted the witness? Does the witness seem to have a good memory? How does the witness look and act while testifying? Does the witness seem to make, be making an honest effort to tell the truth, or does the witness seem to evade the questions or argue with the lawyers? Does the witness's age and maturity affect how you judge his or her testimony? Does the witness have any bias or prejudice or personal interest in how this case is decided? Have there been any promises, threats, or other, or other influences that affect how, you, how the witness testifies? In general, does the witness have any special reason to tell the truth or any special reason to lie? All in all, how reasonable does, does the witness's testimony seem when you think about all the other evidence in the case? The questions the lawyers ask the witnesses are not evidence, only the answers are evidence. You should not think that something is true just because one of the lawyers asks questions that assume or suggest that it is. I may ask some, some of the witnesses questions myself. These questions are, only, are not meant to reflect my opinion about the evidence. 
if I ask questions, my only reason would be asked about things that may not have been fully explored. During the trial, the lawyers, the lawyers may object to certain questions or statements made by the other lawyers or witnesses. I will rule on these objections according to the law. My rulings for or against one side or the other are not meant to reflect my opinions about the facts of the case. Sometimes lawyers and I will have discussions out of your hearing. Also, while you are in the jury room, I may have to take care of other matters that have nothing to do with this case. Pay no attention to these interruptions. You must not discuss the case with anyone, including your family or friends. You must not even discuss it with the other jurors until the time comes for you to decide the case. When it is time for you to decide the case, I will send you to the jury room for that purpose. Then you should discuss the case among yourselves, but only in the jury room and all, only when all the jurors are there. When the trial is over, you may, if you wish, discuss the case with anyone. You may take notes during the trial if you wish, but of course you don't have to. If you do take notes, you should be careful that it does not distract you from paying attention to all the evidence. When you go to the jury room to decide your verdict, you may use your notes to help you remember what happened in the courtroom. Uh, if, you, if you take notes, do not let anyone except the other jurors see them during deliberations. You must turn them over to the clerk during recesses. Your notes will not be examined by anyone other than the jurors during deliberations if you want to. And when your jury service concludes, your notes will be collected and destroyed. If I call for a recess during the trial, I will send you back to the jury room or allow you to leave the courtroom on your own and go about your business. But you, you must not discuss the case with anyone or let anyone discuss it with you or in your presence. If someone tries to do that, tell him or her to stop and explain that as a jury you are not allowed to discuss the case. If he or she continues, leave and report the incident to me as soon as you return to court. You must not talk to the defendants, the lawyers, or the witnesses about anything at all, even if it has nothing to do with this case. It is very important that you uh, only get information about the case in court when you are acting as a jury and when the defendant, the lawyers, and I are all here. You can see that we have chosen a, a, a jury of 14. After you have heard all the evidence and my instructions, we will draw lots to decide which two of you will be dismissed in order to form a jury of 12. This is required by the law. Possible penalty should not influence your decision. It is the duty of the judge to fix the penalty within the limits provided by law. I may give you more instructions during the trial, and at the end of the trial, I will give you detailed instructions about the law in this case. You should consider all of my instructions as a connected series. Take it all together. They are the law you must follow. After all the evidence has been presented and the lawyers have given their arguments, I will give you detailed instructions about the rules of law that apply to this case. Then you will go to the jury room on this, to decide on your verdict. A verdict must be unanimous. That means that every juror must agree on it, and it must reflect the individual decision of each juror. It's important for you to keep an open mind and not, not make a decision about anything in the case until, I, until you go to the jury room to decide the case. The restrictions I'm about to describe are meant to ensure that the uh, parties get a fair trial. In our judicial system, it is crucial that jurors are not influenced by anything or anyone outside the courtroom. Now that many jurors have easy access to information through handheld devices or other technology, jurors may be tempted to use these devices to learn more about some aspect of the case. But if a jury were to do this, it would harm the parties. The party's attorneys would have no way of knowing that a jury has gotten outside information and would have no chance to object if that information was false, untrustworthy, or irrelevant. Remember, no matter how careful and conscientious news reporters, family members, friends, and other people outside the public may be, information about the case from television, radio, the internet, and social media will inevitably be incomplete and could be incorrect. Please bear these things in mind as I read the following instructions. These instructions apply from this moment until I discharge you from jury service. You must decide this case based solely on the evidence you see and hear in this courtroom. You must not consider information that comes from anywhere else. This means that during the trial, you must not read, watch, or listen to news reports about the case, whether in newspapers, on television, on the radio, or on the internet. You must not research any aspect of the case during the trial. This means research using a cellular phone, computer, or other electronic device to search the internet, as well as research with traditional sources like dictionaries, reference manuals, newspapers, or magazines. You must not investigate the case on your own or conduct any experiments concerning the case, including investigation or experiments using the internet, computers, cellular phones, or other electronic devices. You must not visit the scene of any event at issue in this trial. If it is necessary for you to view or visit the scene, court staff will take you there as a group under court supervision. You must not consider as evidence any personal knowledge you have of the scene. Before your deliberations, you must not discuss the case with anyone, even your fellow jurors. After you begin deliberations, you should discuss the case with your fellow jurors, but you still must not discuss the case with anyone else until I discharge you from jury service. 
Until I discharge you from jury service, you must not share any information about the case by any means, including cellular phones or social media. If you discover that a jury has violated my instructions, report it to my clerk. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, my clerk will now uh, pass out uh, some written instructions of the law you must follow. The first sheet uh, contains the law regarding presumption of innocence for the proof of reasonable doubt. The other instructions deal with the elements of the crimes charged, as well as the circumstantial evidence. Okay, it looks like everyone has a copy. I do need to read this into the record. A person accused of a crime is presumed to be innocent. This means that he must start with the presumption that the defendant is innocent. This presumption continues throughout the trial and entitles the defendant to a verdict of not guilty unless you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty. Every crime is made of parts called elements. The prosecutor must prove each element of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant is not required to prove his innocence or to do anything. If you find that the prosecutor has not proven every element beyond a reasonable doubt, then you must find the defendant not guilty. A reasonable doubt is a fair, honest doubt growing out of the evidence or lack of evidence. It's not merely an imaginary or possible doubt, but a doubt based on reason and common sense. A reasonable doubt is just that, a doubt that is reasonable after a careful and considered examination of the facts and circumstances of this case. Count one, first degree premeditated murder. The defendant is charged with the crime of first degree premeditated murder. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the elements, excuse me, each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant caused the death of Maya Kelly, that is, that Maya Kelly died as a result of the defendant shooting her with a firearm. Second, that the defendant intended to kill Maya Kelly. Third, that this intent to kill was premeditated, that is, thought out beforehand. Fourth, that the killing was deliberate, which means that the defendant considered the pros and cons of the killing and thought about and chose his actions before he did it. There must have been a real and substantial reflection for long enough to give a reasonable person a chance to think twice about the intent to kill. The law does not say how much time is needed. It is up for you to decide uh, if enough time passed under the circumstances of this case. The killing cannot be the result of a sudden impulse without thought or reflection. Fifth, that the killing was not justified, excused, or done under circumstances that reduce it to a lesser crime. Next, second degree murder. You may also consider the lesser charge of second degree murder. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant caused the death of Maya Kelly, that is, that Maya Kelly died as a result of the defendant shooting her with a firearm. Second, that the defendant had one of these three states of mind. He intended to kill or he intended to do great bodily harm to Maya Kelly, or he knowingly created a very high risk of death or great bodily harm, knowing that death or such harm would be the likely result of his actions. Next, next count two, carrying a concealed weapon. Um, and I want, want to make sure we're clear about this. Count two is carrying a concealed weapon, but there's two theories here. One is on his person, and one is in a vehicle. That's why there's a hand there, okay? Next, uh, count two, carrying a concealed weapon. First, on person. The defendant is charged with the crime of carrying, conceal, uh, carrying a concealed pistol. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant knowingly carried a pistol. It does not matter whether the defendant was carrying the pistol. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Let me read that again. I, I apologize. Once you start reading a lot, you start making mistakes. So, anyway, let's go through the elements again. First, that the defendant knowingly carried a pistol. It does not matter why the defendant was carrying the pistol. But to be guilty of this crime, the defendant must have known that he was carrying a pistol. Second, that this pistol was concealed on or about the person of the defendant. Complete invisibility is not required. A pistol is concealed if it cannot easily be seen by those who come into ordinary contact with the defendant. And then the second theory of carrying a concealed weapon would be within a vehicle. The defendant is charged with the crime of carrying a, a pistol in a vehicle. To prove this charge, the defendant must the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that a pistol was in a vehicle that the defendant was in. Second, that the defendant knew the pistol was there. Third, that the defendant took part in carrying or keeping the pistol in the vehicle. Next, count three, possession of a firearm. 
The defendant is charged with the crime of possession of a firearm when he was ineligible to do so. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant knowingly possessed or used a firearm in this state. Second, at that time, the defendant was ineligible to possess a firearm. The defendant stipulates that he was ineligible to possess a firearm at the time of these alleged events. Next, count four, felony firearm. The defendant is also charged with a separate crime of possessing a firearm at the time he committed the crime of murder. To prove this charge, the prosecutor must prove each of the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. First, that the defendant committed the crime of murder, which has been defined for you. It is not necessary, however, that the defendant be convicted of that crime. Second, that at the, at the time the defendant committed the crime, he knowingly carried or possessed a firearm. It does not matter whether or not the firearm was capable of firing a projectile or whether it was loaded. A pistol is a firearm. Finally, circumstantial evidence. Facts can be proved by direct evidence from a witness or an exhibit. Direct evidence is evidence about what we actually see or hear. For example, if you look outside and see rain falling, that would be, that is direct evidence that it is rain. Facts can also be proved by indirect or circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that normally or reasonably leads to other facts. So, for example, if you see a person come in from outside wearing a raincoat covered with small drops of water, that would be circumstantial evidence that it is raining. You may consider circumstantial evidence, circumstantial evidence by itself, or a combination of circumstantial evidence and direct evidence can be used to prove the elements of a crime. In other words, you should consider all the evidence that you believe. You may refer to these instructions during the trial. Since no one can predict the course of the trial, these instructions may change at the end of the trial. I'm giving these instructions only for you to use as a guide during the course of the trial. Do not place any more emphasis on these instructions than the ones I give you orally during the course of the trial. You'll notice that we do not have an actual court reporter. We have an electronic courtroom. That means all of the witnesses are being reported to a DVD. Please listen carefully to the witnesses. You will not automatically be given a transcript of any, any witness's testimony. To get a transcript can sometimes take hours or days. You absolutely need to rehear the testimony of a witness. Uh, then we will probably make arrangements to play the witness's entire testimony back for you. So please listen carefully. All right. At this point, uh, opening statements, Mr. Faber, are you going to handle this aspect? Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Mr. Faber will handle the uh, opening for the people. Go ahead, Mr. Faber. Thank you, south of here between Ionia and Division, uh, just north of Hall Street on a, on a residential street called Canton Street Southwest. Um, on Monday, the day after Christmas, December 26, 2022, at about 9.50 p.m., a horrific and cowardly crime was committed in a matter of moments at the residence shown in the upper left there, 47 Canton Street. It's the first residence <clears throat> to the east of Ionia, and then a, basically a full city block uh, toward Division. 47 Canton Street is a uh, duplex, and the westerly uh, apartment is 47, in the same building to the right, uh, to the east is 43 Canton. This is the front of the house. Um, 47 Canton again is the door to the left. So on this night at 9.50 p.m., the evidence is going to show that the defendant approached the house and fired several shots into the door, one of which struck and killed victim Maya Kelly. She was shot in the head through that door of her own apartment. You will learn from her boyfriend, Omar Dana, who will be testifying this morning, that he and Maya and their two kids, their two young children, were getting ready that night to watch a movie when 
there was a knock at the door. The evidence is going to show that that was the defendant that was knocking at the door. Some mumbled words were stated, and then shots rang out through the door. Omar is going to tell you that he did not see the defendant shoot. The next door neighbors, the Atkinsons, you're going to hear from them this morning. They also did not see, they did not look outside. They heard three to four shots, and by the time they looked outside, the defendant had already made an escape. So there is, uh, there is no eyewitness to the defendant shooting these rounds. The evidence is going to be shown that the identity of the defendant as, as the perpetrator occurred over the hours, days, and weeks of the police investigation. Police arrived um, within approximately 10 minutes after the shooting. Omar uh, calls the police. Uh, when the shooting rang out, he acted to protect his kids and uh, did not look outside, did not see uh, the shooter. When the police arrived, you're going to see the first responding officer, Officer Middleton. You're going to see a portion of his body-worn camera. Grand Rapids police have a camera fixed to the center of their chest, and you're going to watch a portion of that as, uh, as the first responder uh, to the scene. The uh, there's, uh, there's a medical response, there's a, there's a huge police response, including crime scene technicians that come and process the scene. You're going to hear from the crime scene technician that process the scene for evidence. So without an eyewitness to the actual shooter, police begin a canvas of the area. They, they, uh, they go door to door and they're looking for witnesses that heard or saw anything, and they're looking for cameras. The cameras, uh, on Canton Street, there were uh, two directly on Canton that uh, provided extremely valuable evidence. The first one, five houses down from uh, 47 Canton Street at 23 Canton, heading east about midway through the block on the north side, also 23 Canton. There is a surveillance camera that was affixed to the front of the residence. You'll learn that uh, when police obtained that video evidence, they observed a lone figure uh, running from the area of 47 Canton east toward Division Avenue. The next camera that was uh, discovered by police is at Luna Auto at the southwest corner of uh, Canton and Division. And that camera faces to the north and it picked up that same, uh, that, that same figure in a much clearer image. It's a good camera, it's a good camera angle from some distance. Um, but uh, that figure, who the evidence will prove uh, beyond any reasonable doubt was the defendant, is running to a car that is waiting, that is backed into an empty spot at Luna Auto. Uh, you'll see on video the person that the evidence will show is the defendant running and getting into the passenger door of that car. The car drives out, drives south on Division, down to Hall and Division, one block south. And then the Sunoco camera, which also has audio, picks up the defendant, uh, the, the vehicle the defendant is in, turning from Division, westbound on Hall Street. This vehicle is very distinctive. It is a, Do a silver Dodge Journey with uh, extensive damage to the right or to the driver's side uh, door near the front wheel, and on the passenger side, there's very distinctive damage on the passenger door. Damage that you can see throughout the video evidence that's going to be portrayed to you. That is the uh, single biggest piece of evidence that led to the discovery of the defendant as the perpetrator in this crime. That vehicle leads to a man by the name of Marquise Welch. You're going to hear, he'll be testifying this week. Marquise Welch, you'll learn, is, is or perhaps was a very good friend of the defendant uh, for, for many years. And Marquise uh, was arrested the next day, the 27th of December, in that vehicle that the police uh, were looking for. So you're going to learn that 
Mr. Welch was arrested, uh, charged with crimes that were unrelated to this homicide, but he's facing his own, he has his own criminal case, and he's brought into court under what is known as an investigative subpoena interview. Now, for those of you that are unaware or unfamiliar with what an investigative subpoena <coughs> process is, Michigan law allows the prosecuting attorney to file a petition for uh, serious crimes such as homicide and uh, present that to a judge, a neutral magistrate, to review the petition and authorize subpoenas, which are court orders to appear, for people that the prosecution identifies as potential witnesses to a, a serious felony charge. All right, so this process was done in this case. Marquise Welch was, uh, because of the undeniable fact that his vehicle was at the scene of a murder, uh, uh, that process was done. Mr. Welch was uh, brought in under investigative subpoena into this, this building, a different courtroom, but brought into court and questioned under oath about his knowledge of the case. All right, so what you'll learn with, as you go through the trial and examine yourselves, Mr. Welch, uh, it's going to be a study in human nature. What you're going to have is a juxtaposition between various um, interests. You're going to have a conflict uh, between self-interest and loyalty to a friend, a friend who he knew had committed a murder. So those, those two interests you'll see during the course of this trial come to loggerheads and there's, there's, a, there's a conflict that I want you to carefully examine because it is human nature when under subpoena, when you know that you're, attacked, you're, you're linked to a vehicle that was at the scene of a murder, you're going to cooperate and provide truthful testimony because you, don't, you know you're not the shooter and you don't want to be charged with perjury for lying during the course of the investigative subpoena interview. There's a penalty for lying when you're under oath. So he provides very valuable evidence during the course of that investigative subpoena interview. He had an attorney present for, for that interview. It's in a courtroom. His friend, the defendant, was not present. So he's providing information that incriminates uh, Mr. Newberg, the defendant. His own case, he's got valuable information. You'll learn, that, as that is very common in criminal cases, that he has a bargaining chip now that he can use to leverage, uh, to put himself in a better position for his own criminal case. You're going to learn that he played that card. And you're going to learn that he provided what is known as a proffered statement uh, to the detectives as part of the plea negotiations. That proffered statement, he, uh, Mr. Welch had an attorney with him. The defendant was not present uh, to witness his statement. And during the course of the investigative subpoena interview and during the proper statement to police, this all happens in January of uh, 2023, he provides extremely valuable information in this criminal case. The evidence, this is an outline, uh, just an overview of the evidence you're going to learn that uh, was uh, brought forth by Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch gave the defendant a 9mm Glock pistol. Glock is, is a manufacturer. Uh, in the months prior to the murder, he wasn't sure if it was a Glock Model 17 or a Glock Model 19. Those are model numbers. Glock is the manufacturer. It's like a Toyota uh, Camry. To, you know, so um, the, the model number of the 17 and the 19, those are both 9mm pistols. You're going to learn that. Mr. Welch picked the defendant up on the day of the murder at this store called The Big Top near 36th and Clyde Park in the city of Wyoming. You're going to see that on video. From there, they drive to an Airbnb at 755 College that was rented by a man by the name of Isaiah Smith. You're going to, Isaiah Smith is going to testify during the course of this trial. And they go there for the purpose of filming or manufacturing a rap music video. In that video, and you're going to see that video, you're going to see the defendant holding a Glock pistol that has an attachment. So there are, 
There are pistols that have underneath the barrel a rail system that you can attach a flashlight or a laser sight. And you're going to see in this video that the pistol the defendant's holding is a Glock and it has a laser sight, a very unique laser sight because the color of this laser is blue. You're going to hear from Michigan State Police Detect, uh, forensic um, and firearm expert Russ uh, Karsten who's going to tell you that in his 25 years of experience, he has never actually seen a laser light that is blue. They're, they're red and they're green. So this is a very unique uh, laser attachment. From there, Welch drives in his Dodge uh, journey with the defendant from 755 College directly to 47 Canton where he is dropped off outside the house just before 9.50 p.m. Welch drives to the end of the street. You'll see on video that uh, Mr. Welch backing his Dodge up into the spot, and then as soon as he backs up into the spot at Luna Auto, the headlights go off. Within 30 seconds of that act, while the car is still running with the brake lights on, but the headlights off, you see the defendant running and getting into Mr. Welch's car, which then immediately drives off. You'll learn during the course of the proffered statement that Mr. Welch revealed that the defendant told him, and he quoted, I shot that bitch. During the proffer, you'll learn that he, clar he said, and he clarified, I don't know if he meant the house or the girl. Again, the investigative subpoena interview and the proffered statement, his friend, the defendant, is not present. So fast forward from there to the preliminary examination on this case, which occurred uh, toward the end of January uh, 2023. During that hearing, which is a probable cause hearing, Mr. Walsh provided sworn testimony. The difference here, and this is where uh, the, the, the conflicting interests come to loggerheads, is during this hearing, the defendant is present. So he's looking at his friend while he's testifying. And he's consistent with uh, the, the prior statements with one difference. When it comes to the statement, I shot that bitch, during the testimony while he's looking at his friend, the defendant, he says, I think he said, we shot that bitch, and uh, insinuated or hinted that I believe he was thinking about shooting the rap video. All right, so with Mr. Welch, I ask you, I, I would ask you to, to scrutinize every piece of evidence and every witness, but really take a, 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 a critical and scrutinizing look at Mr. Welch's testimony and bounce everything he says off of all of the other facts and evidence in the case. You, it, it's, it's going to be a study in, in human nature. I ask you to keep that in mind as you evaluate his credibility. Bounce all of his evidence against the other evidence in the case. Because the evidence is going to show there is a significant amount of corroboration for what Mr. Welch provided to the police. You're going to see phone and cell tower evidence that, that geolocates uh, the cell phones that Mr. Welch was in possession of and uh, the defendant, Mr. Newburn, was in possession of. Those exactly match the timeline and uh, travel of the defendant and Mr. Welch throughout that day. You're going, uh, Mr. Welch said that he gave the defendant a Glock pistol in the months before the murder. Mr. Uh, Newburn, the defendant's phone, was seized and was analyzed. You're going you're gonna to learn the results of that analysis. On the defendant's own phone is a picture of the defendant himself in a car holding a Glock pistol, and you can see the caliber on the side, 9 millimeter caliber. So you don't need to take Mr. Welch's uh, a word that he gave him a gun. The gun consistent with what he gave, uh, what he said he gave to the defendant, is on the defendant's own phone in the defendant's own photograph. The, uh, the ballistic analysis, you had, there were shell casings that were found at the scene, and there was a projectile, there's, there, there's one projectile, and unfortunately you're going to learn 
but that was the projectile that was recovered during the autopsy of Maya Kelly from her skull. That was analyzed. It has very distinct uh, rifling on the, on, the, on, the, on the projectile itself. Rifling, you'll learn, is the distinct marks that the lead bullet will make as it uh, traverses the length of a, of a firearm barrel. Uh, ballistic evidence is, is going to prove that it's consistent with a 9mm. It, they, they, the expert can't say that it is a 9mm because it was a portion of the bullet. And he says it's, it's consistent with a 9mm class. All the shell casings that were recovered at the scene, uh, he's going to testify were all fired from the same gun. And those shell casings were 9mm. The, the distinct rifling, in his expert opinion, you're going to learn, is from a Glock match barrel, a proprietary Glock barrel. We don't have the, the firearm in evidence because you're going to learn that the defendant successfully escaped the scene and got rid of the gun that has a body on it, as the street uh, says, um, and, and you'll learn that that's very customary. Uh, Glock, 9mm, just like the gun that is in the defendant's uh, own phone photograph, just like the gun that uh, Mr. Welch said he gave to the defendant, just like the gun that's in the video in the hour before the murder. You're going to learn all of these consistencies that corroborate Mr. Welch's testimony. The blue laser light, the very unique uh, blue laser light, exactly like the one that's on the video the night of the murder, was found in a search during a, a search warrant execution at the defendant's apartment on 36th Street near the Big Top. And hidden in a child's room, you're, you'll see where this was hidden, uh, very carefully hidden to avoid detection, is the blue laser light attachment. You're going to see that laser light attachment as an, as an exhibit in court. What you won't see is the firearm that we know it was attached to on the night of the murder because that firearm is gone. Pay careful attention to the timing in the video evidence because circumstantially, the defendant, we're going to prove beyond any reasonable doubt, was dropped off at precisely the time that the shooting occurred. And you see the defendant fleeing the scene and running to Mr. Welch's waiting car. The car drives by twice. So the camera's on 23 Canton, five houses down, 47 Canton. You can't see 47 Canton from the 23 camera angle, but you see Mr. Welch's car drive by, and he confirmed this, and you can see the damage on the door that's ex that, that is exactly a match. You don't need to take Mr. Welch's word for it. This was the Dodge Journey that's associated with Mr. Welch. You see that drive by at 946. Exactly three minutes later, which is how long it took to go to Division, down to Hall, back over to Ionia, north on Ionia to Canton, and then back. Three minutes later, you see Mr. Welch driving past again, only this time he had dropped off the defendant in front of 47 Canton at the defendant's direction. Dropped me off in front of his house. 40 seconds later, after he backs into the stall, turns his lights off, 40 seconds later, the defendant is seen running into the car. Now with the headlights off, you're going to see that car go down division, past the Sunoco station again, driving all that way with the headlights off. As with Mr. Welch, because of the severity of this investigation, when the defendant, uh, when search warrants were executed, the defendant was arrested, he was brought in and, and under investigative subpoena, subpoena means under penalty, so it's a court order to appear. He was brought in. He had an attorney with him, uh, Robert Mirke. He was placed under oath. I did the, uh, the interview of the defendant for his version of events. And you're going to hear that video. You're, you're, you're going to see that interview. You're going to learn when the defendant had an opportunity to give his side of the story, what did he do? You'll learn that he lied through his teeth. Watch the interview carefully, because the things that he lied about show, the evidence will show, is called consciousness of guilt. 
he, the, the one thing he admitted, because he knows he's on video, is that he was at uh, the Airbnb at 755 College that night. But Mr. Welch wasn't there. He's, he, he even says it almost, almost jokingly. Um, well, and, and Mr. Welch was, I know Mr. Welch wasn't there because if Mr. Welch was there, uh, he, would have given, he would have given me a ride home and I, didn't, I wouldn't have had to take a lift. Okay. He denies being in that Dodge journey any time that entire day, provably false by the video that you're going to see during the course of the trial. He was asked, well, have you, have you ever been to 47 Canton, inside or outside? No. In fact, I have never been on Canton Street. Mr. Newburn, did you possess a gun or anything resembling a gun on December 26, 2022? Hell no. Okay. He's on video with a gun. I even, I even, you'll, you'll learn, I even say this. You know, I, I've seen a lot of rap videos and it's common to have a firearm. Are you just telling me that you didn't have a gun? A, a real gun or a, or, or a fake gun as a prop. Are you telling me under oath right now that you, I, I did not possess a gun at all that day? Again, a provable lie. Those three key lies are just a, a, a portion of uh, his testimony, but they were all self-serving because consciousness of guilt. He knows that those things connect him to this murder. And he lied under oath and given an opportunity. The evidence is going to show, and this is a, this is a portion of it, that the defendant possessed a 9mm Glock for the months leading up to uh, the murder. He possessed a 9mm Glock on the day of the murder, within an hour of the murder on video. He arrives at 47 Canton precisely at the moment the murder occurred. The murder was committed with a 9mm block. The defendant is going to be provably on video fleeing the scene and getting into Mr. Welch's waiting car. The defendant admitted the shooting to Mr. Welch. The defendant had a blue laser sight, that very unique laser sight, hidden in, and, and wait till you see where, where it's hidden. Um, in the 36th Street address within two weeks of the murder. That's January 11th is when that laser sight was found. Um, the laser sight that's seen on the rap video. The judge already uh, discussed the charges. He went over the elements. I'm not going to, to revisit that. Um, but if, if you will note during the course of the trial that motive, the, the why, is not an element of any of these offenses. These offenses. I just need to prove to you, Mr. Corbett and I, that these offenses occurred. They were committed by the defendant intentionally. We are going to try with the witnesses that are brought forth here this week to answer the question of why. Because it's, it's important. But it is not an element of any of the offenses. At the end of the day, at the end of this trial, you may not know why the defendant committed these crimes. But I'm confident that beyond a reasonable doubt, Ms. Corbett and I are going to prove to you that he did commit these crimes. And we're going to be asking for a verdict of guilty as to all counts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Faber. Shirkoff, opening statement? Yes.
Newburn is not the one that did it. They have absolutely no direct evidence showing that. They have put together some stuff that might imply that maybe the person uh, that did it might have been Mr. Newburn, might not have been. That's why in my questioning for in Wadir was, you know, when you hold the prosecutor to the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. Because they cannot prove that Mr. Newburn did this beyond a reasonable doubt. And he did not. Uh, they are relying upon, heavily upon, the testimony of a Marquise Welch. And I'll be honest with you right up front, I don't have any idea what the Marquise Welch is going to come in and say. He has made numerous conflicting statements about this incident. So I don't want to predict and say, well, here's what he's going to say, and you know, it's right or wrong or what, indifferent. He's made way too many different statements for me to predict what he's going to say. But in the end, uh, you will have a chance to see everything. There is this investigative subpoena where my client was test, uh, was questioned on July, January 11th. And you'll also hear at the very beginning, they picked him up at Lansing, brought him right back down here and questioned him within an hour, hour and a half of him being picked up. And he'll tell you right at the very beginning, I'm drunk from last night. I'm still high from last night. And you'll see from his demeanor that that is absolutely true. So I think there is a question about his accuracy of this questioning that you're going to see on the investigative subpoena. But the fact remains, when you put everything together, they cannot show that Mr. Newburn did it and Mr. Newburn did not do it. And we are requesting a not hurt, a guilty verdict at the end of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. First witness counsel. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, the first witness will be Officer Andrew Middleton. My first name is Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W. My last name is Middleton, M-I-D-D-L-E-T-O-N. Thank you. How are you currently employed? Currently employed with the City of Grand Rapids as a patrol officer. How long have you worked in that capacity? It'll be five years in April, next month. Were you working as a patrol officer with the City of Grand Rapids back on the day of this incident, on December 26th of 2022? That is correct, I was. On that date, what location were you dispatched to? 47 Canton Street, Southwest. Is that in the city of Grand Rapids here in Kent County? It is. Uh, can you please give um, the jury an idea of where that street is located within our city? It's going to be just off uh, division um, in the south service area of Grand Rapids. And I'm going to show you what I've... Strike that. i got just one moment. Your Honor, may the record reflect that the defense is stipulated to the People's Exhibits 1 through 5. Is that correct? That is correct. 1 through 5 are admitted. Thank you. Officer Middleton, I'm going to show you what has been admitted in this trial as People's Exhibit 2. Um, this is just a poster board of the exhibit that I just put up on the easel. Do you recognize what is shown there? I do. 
Um, can you please describe that, that for the jury? There's also a laser pointer right in front of you, if that's helpful. Um, if you can kind of indicate for the jury where Canton is located at. So Canton Street is going to be located um, in between Ionia Avenue Southwest and Division on the north side of the street, right where that bullet point is located right there. Thank you. Officer Middleton, what time of the day or night were you dispatched to that location on December 26th? It was December 26th at approximately 2155 hours, so 9.55 p.m. approximately. And that was the approximate time of the dispatch? That is correct. And after you were dispatched, how quickly would you say that you arrived? Within minutes. Were you the first officer on scene or were other officers there before you? I believe I was one of the first. Can you please describe for the jury what the scene was like on Canton Street when you arrived? So we were in lights and sirens to the scene. Uh, upon arrival, um, I exited my patrol cruiser. Um, the neighbors at 43 Canton, some, somebody from that address uh, screamed something along the lines of, she shot in reference to um, an individual being shot at 47 Canton Street Southwest. And it's 43 Canton and 47 Canton. Is that a duplex? So those are those an attached home? That is correct. It's adjoined. And what did you do next? Um, at that time, um, we made announcements. Uh, there was a male subject that was uh, came to the door. He was ordered out of the house. Um, out of which house? 47 Canton. And so when you initially approached 47 Canton, did you see that male, that person? Uh, I, I don't. I don't believe if I saw him right off the bat, or if he was ordered out of the house. Um, but he was secured in a patrol cruiser um, after contact was made with that male subject. And is it fair to say that the first people you saw on scene were the neighbors at 43 Canton? That is correct. Um, at that time, besides what they were yelling out to you, did you notice anything else unusual in the area? Did you notice any other people? Um, I noticed that the door to 47 Canton Southwest uh, was partially open and I saw what appeared to be two human legs um, in that space in between the open door and uh, on the ground there. Did you actually go inside 47 Canton? I did. Were you the first officer that went inside? Uh, I was one of the first. I don't recall if I was the first one. Uh, can you please describe uh, what you observed inside? Uh, after forcing entry into the house by pushing that door open, um, I turned the corner and um, I immediately observed uh, what appeared to be a large quantity of blood on the ground um, close to where the stairwell was leading to the upstairs. Uh, there is a female subject lying on her back. Um, I observed uh, what appeared to be a uh, large sum of blood coming from the left side of her head near her ear. And was that person later identified as Maya Kelly? That is correct. Uh, at that time, was she conscious? She was unconscious at that time. Uh, she was not breathing, um, and I was unable to locate a, a pulse. Were any life-saving measures attempted? I performed chest compressions on the victim for approximately two minutes. And after that, was she later pronounced deceased? That is correct. Did you observe any other injuries on the person of Maya Kelly at that time? The only injuries that I physically observed um, on the victim were the uh, apparent gunshot wound that she had um, to the left side of her head near her ear. And so at that moment when you were performing chest compressions on the victim, were there any other um, civilian adults in the house? Any other, any other people in the house? At the time that I was inside the house, my sole focus was on the victim. Um, other officers cleared the house, I'm, I'm unsure. And at the time that you entered 47 Canton, uh, were you wearing a body camera attached to your uniform? That is correct. Uh, and you actually have that on right now as you're testifying? Yep. Just, one right here. Just so the jury can see yep. where that's located. Um, it wasn't activated uh, back in the day of this incident. It was activated. Um, at this time, Your Honor, I move to play for the jury um, a portion of Officer Middleton's body-worn camera, uh, which is People's Exhibit 3.
Uh, any objection? I assume it's been not because it's been admitted. It's been admitted to show. You give me a lot of pleasure. Um, and I would note, Your Honor, that um, images of the victim will be shown here. So if there's anyone in the gallery that does not want to see these images, um, I would just make that warning at this time. Okay. And is there a period of silence to begin this? I don't believe so. Um, I believe it picks up right away. Okay. Sometimes there's a little bit of silence after the camera comes up. Is that right, uh, sir? Sometimes there's a, a, like, there's no, the sound doesn't kick on right away. It's first the visual kicks on, then the sound kicks on later. I believe it's, uh, 15 to 20 seconds okay. of silence. Okay, I help the jury for this or some other way. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. The people will now play People's Exhibit 3. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Directly after that video stops, uh, as previously mentioned, I performed life-saving measures um, until the victim was pronounced deceased. Um, and then we immediately secured the area, uh, canvas the area, um, and then I talked to the neighbors at 43 Canton Street South. And when you say we canvassed the area, can you please describe to the jury what that means? Uh, that includes taping off, looking for shell casings or any other evidence um, on the streets or nearby indicative of um, anything related to that shooting scene. Did you locate any such items? I did not. Uh, did you locate any uh, possible suspects in the area? I did not. And fair to say other officers showed up on scene as well? That is correct. How many officers would you say responded to the scene that night? I couldn't give an exact number. I'd probably place it around 15. Did other officers also canvas the area as well? That is correct. Did you personally check for any interior or exterior video surveillance at 47 Canton? At 47 Canton specifically, I believe I checked the exterior near that door. And how about next door at 43 Canton? 
I check for exterior cameras on the south side of that so, address. Oh, I'm sorry. You did check for video surveillance? On the exterior. Uh, and so did you find any exterior video surveillance at either 47 or 43? I did not. Did you go next door to 43 Canton and speak with the residents inside? That is correct. Uh, and without getting into everything that they said at this point, uh, can you please describe for the jury just what their demeanor was like, who was there? Can you please describe that? <clears throat> Uh, the, the complainant who initially called in the shooting incident uh, is the female that I primarily spoke with at 43 Cannon Street Southwest. Um, just from my conversation, uh, the complainant appeared extremely distraught and upset over the incident. When you went next door to 43 Canton, did you observe any children? That is correct. Do you know where those children came from? Did they live at 43 or did they come from somewhere else? I believe two of the children uh, came from 47 Canton Street Southwest and the complainant um, when she initially went over there uh, prior to calling us, she took the two children from 47 Canton Street Southwest and moved them into her address, 43. So when you actually spoke with them, uh, they were watching those kids? That is correct. Did you personally speak with anyone else on scene that day? Just the complainant at 43 Cannon Street Southwest. Were you involved in any other part of this investigation? No. Officer Middleton, did you, when you were inside 47 Canton, did you observe weapons of any kind? I did not. My primary focus was on the victim when she was located. And so besides um, having contact with the victim and attempting life-saving measures with her, did you note anything else unusual or out of the ordinary inside 47 Canton? Besides the victim, no. And did you observe any weapons or find anything outside 47 Canton or 43 Canton? I did not. Did you observe any weapons on Omar Dana? I did not. And were any weapons ever located on him? I don't believe so. I didn't search him. Thank you, officer. I have no other questions at this time. Sure, Ralph, any questions for this witness? There was snow on the ground on this night, correct? That is correct. And do you remember if it was snowing at all during this incident, either immediately before or during <coughs> your time there? I don't recall. No further questions. Anything else, Mr. Bett? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Officer Middleton. You're excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, Okay, next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Officer Van Lee. Morning, sir. Please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, if you got it, yes, ma'am. Very good. Please go ahead, Mr. Beck. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Morning. Did you get situated? I did. I'm also. Could you please tell the jurors your name and also spell it for the record? Yeah, Officer Van Vliet. Uh, Van Vliet spelled V A N V L I E T. Thank you. How are you currently employed? Uh, I'm a canine officer with the City of Grand Rapids Police Department. How long have you worked in that capacity? Uh, nine years. Were, were you working as an officer with the City of Grand Rapids back on December 26th of 2022? Yes, ma'am. Uh, were you dispatched to the location of 47 Canton Street on December 26th? Yes, ma'am. Was Officer Middleton already there when you arrived? Yeah, either just before I arrived or right when I arrived. 
Uh, were you one of the um, initial officers that responded, or did you get there later? Initial officers. How many officers were on scene when you got there? Do you remember? Uh, I do not remember. Can you please describe to the jury what your primary role was on scene that night? Yeah, so um, the best of my recollection, the call came in where somebody had been shot at the address or near 47 Canton. Um, we arrived on scene to initially find out uh, where the victim was, and our job then was to either render aid to the victim or scene security. Did you actually have contact with the victim when you were on scene, or was that more of Officer Middleton? Uh, we both, uh, it was an obvious that the victim was beyond help at that point. Did you have contact with anyone else on scene? Did you speak with anyone else? Yes, I did. And who was that? Uh, the victim's boyfriend, Omar Donna. Can you please describe to the jury when you first saw him, or can you just describe the scene as it relates to Omar? Yes, when we, uh, we arrived on scene, um, we were approaching the house, Omar kind of burst from the house, uh, pretty panicked, um, didn't really wasn't able to really articulate any sentences, so I gathered him and uh, checked him for weapons to make sure there was none on him, and he was secured in the backseat of a police car. Uh, did you search Omar Dana? I did. Did he have any weapons on him? No, ma'am. At that time, um, you said he was secured in the back of a patrol car. Why was that done at that time? Uh, to conduct an interview, um, as well as keep him out of the cold. If he was, at this date, it was the end of December, and it was pretty cold outside. So. Mm -hmm. uh, was it snowing? It had been snowing. Had it been snowing that day or previous days, or do you not know? I do not. But it wasn't actively snowing when you arrived? Not to my recollection, no. And can you please describe uh, the demeanor of Omar Dana? When he first came out of the house, how was he acting? He was in a state of shock. He wasn't really able to answer any questions initially that I was asking him. Did you later on have a more detailed conversation with him? Yes, ma'am. When you had a conversation with him, was he still in the back of the cruiser? Yes, ma'am. At that time, were you wearing a body-worn camera that was attached to your uniform? I was, ma'am. And was it activated on that date? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this time, Your Honor, the people would move to play for the jury uh, what has been um, stipulated to and admitted um, as People's Exhibit 4, the body-worn camera from Officer Van Lee. Any objection? No, <coughs> Thank you. 
again, it was, I think it was a little bit more clear, but of course the jury will have that as well as an um, exhibit and evidence that they can use during their deliberations. That's true. <coughs> well, listen to it during deliberations you can. Officer Van Vliet, um, so that person in the back of the cruiser, that was Omar Dana, correct? That's correct. Um, and did that person have children in common with Maya Kelly? Yes, ma'am, two children in common. And so during that time, did Mr. Dana, uh, did he ever indicate to you that he knew who was involved? No, he did not. Uh, did he ever say that he saw the shooter? No, he did not. Uh, did he know who the shooter was? No, he did not. During that conversation, did he ever give you any possible suspect names? No, he did not. During that clip that we just saw, do you recall or did you hear the point where you asked, does Terrell have anything to do with this? Yes, I do. Uh, when you say Terrell, who is Terrell? Uh, it's a family member of his. And why did you ask that question when you did? Uh, previous week, I believe uh, about maybe two weeks earlier or one week earlier, there was an incident at that same address um, involving a Terrell who was arrested out of that address for, a, I believe, armed robbery. Um, when you say that address, was that 47 Canton? Yes, ma'am, 47 Canton. And were you were you personally present um, at that incident the week or two before? Yes, I was. Uh, was that on December 19th? That sounds correct. And so on that date, on December 19th at 47 Canton, was Omar Dana there on that date? Yes, he was. And Terrell was there on that date? Yes, he was. What is Terrell's last name? I do not recall. Um, does Terrell Franklin sound correct, or do you just not know? I, I just don't know. Not looking at the but it was Terrell. Correct. When you were on scene that day, did you speak with anyone else? I did not. Uh, did you ever enter into 43 Canton? I did. Uh, what was the purpose for you entering into 43 Canton? That was to check the welfare of the children. And uh, how were they? They were okay. How old were they? I do not recall the exact ages, but they were young, probably four, three, four years old. Uh, and then at that time, they were in the custody of the neighbors at 43 Canton? That is correct. Do you know who notified uh, Maya Kelly's family about her death? Yes. Who did? Myself and Chief Eric Winstrom. And Chief Winstrom was on scene as well? That's correct. And who did you notify about Maya's death? Which family member? It was the mother. <laughs> Was that Angela Arnold? Yes. Did you have any other involvement in the investigation of this case? I did not. I can have just one moment, Your Honor. You indicated already that you checked Omar Dana for weapons and that did not find any, correct? Correct. Were you involved with clearing the house at all at 47 Canton? Yes. Can you please describe that for the jury? Yep. So in a situation like that with a homicide, we want to check and make sure there's no other victims inside the house um, or anybody who's potentially lying in wait. So we just check the residence and make sure there is either one, no more victims or anyone hiding. Did you find any other victims? No, we did not. Did you find um, anyone else inside? No, we did not. Did you find any weapons? No, we did not. Anything else unusual uh, that you took note of inside 47 Canton? Other than the physical evidence that was inside that threshold of the front door, no, we did not. Uh, the physical evidence surrounding the door and surrounding Maya, things like that? That is correct. Okay, thank you, officer. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Dana told you he did not see who did this, correct? That's correct, sir. But he did tell you that person had a weird voice and sounded like a white male, didn't he? Yes, he did. He also told you that uh, Maya, op you recalled Maya opening the front door and having an argument with whoever was outside. That's correct. No other questions? Anything else, Mr. Beck? There's one moment, Your Honor. Sure.
Officer Van Vliet, just to clarify, you know, the timing of the statements that you just referenced. Um, so did you have a, a more detailed conversation with Omar Dana besides what we saw on your, on your body cam? I did not. So the statements that Mr. Kirkhoff just asked you about, would those have been at a different point in time? Or would it all be captured here? That was all captured there. And so when you had said that Omar Dana said that Maya had opened the door, do you recall him saying that? Without, after seeing the video, that, um, no, he's in my open the door, correct. But that any statements that Omar gave would be captured on this body cam that we just played here in court. That is correct. Um, and it's, you're not referring to any other time that he gave you additional statements? Not that I can recall, no. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank Anything you. else, Mr. Kirkhoff? No, Your Honor, I just... <coughs> In the event that uh, I may need him to recall him to impeach Mr. Dana, I just ask that he be available. Okay. All right, sir, you're temporarily excused. You might be called back. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. All right, I think this is an appropriate time to take a break. I'm going to take a very short break, so I think it's a good time. Don't you? I agree. All right, thank you. All right, uh, we're going to take a break about 10.30. We'll keep away. Thank you for your attention this morning, and I appreciate that you got here early today as well. All right, I'll rise to the next to the jury. We'll see you about 10.30.
Ready? Give me a second. Yeah, it's, it's her next witness, so, so I might not be in the courtroom, but we're ready. You're ready. Okay. Jen, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Gary, I'm going to need exhibit 26. Yeah, I'm just going to, yeah. Use your computer or anything? I'll be back in 30, 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Okay, anything before you bring the jury back out and back? Your Honor, just that I will have um, one other witness here in person, then a witness on Zoom will follow that. Okay. Have you seen the other witness by Zoom? I have. Okay, very good. And also, Your Honor, may the record reflect that uh, Mr. Kirkhoff has stipulated to the admission of People's Exhibits 6 through 21. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. 6 through 21 are admitted, although we probably should let that. We'll let the jury know that as well. Thank you. Just looking at your witness list, is there a difference between Erica Shanice Atkinson and Erica Atkinson? There is. They are mother and daughter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. One is in person and the other is Zoom. I see. Okay. Thank you. 
that next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Erica Atkinson. That's E R I C K A A T K I N S O N. And Ms. Atkinson, do you also have a daughter by the same name? I do. Uh, does she also have a middle name? Yes, Shanice. And how do you spell that? S H A N I C E. Thank you. Ms. Atkinson, I'd like to direct your attention back to the day of this incident on December 26th of 2022. Do you recall that day? I do. On that day, were you in the area of Canton Street? I was. Do you live in that area or does your daughter, could you please describe that for the jury? Um, my daughter lives in the area and I'm often over there with her and my granddaughter. I stay the night at times. And do you recall what the address was, uh, where your daughter lived at? 43 Canton. And I'm going to put a photo up here, uh, which is uh, People's Exhibit 5 that has already been admitted in this trial. Uh, do you recognize that? I do. And what is that? Um, on the right side, of the screen, my daughter lives there, and on the left side, Maya lived there. So you're saying on the, the right side of the screen? Yes. That would have been where your daughter lived? Correct. And how about on the left side of the screen? Who lived there, if you know? Maya. Did you know Maya? I did. And how did you know her? Like I said, I often went over there, and I played with her kids, with my granddaughter, and. I spoke with her from time to time. How many kids did Maya have? Two. And at the time of her death, how old were they? Um, I believe her oldest was four and her youngest was one. Do you know who the father of those children is? Yes. And who is that? Omar. Do you know his last name? No. And do you know Omar well? Not well. I'm just passing by, high and by. Is it fair to say you knew Maya uh, more than you knew Omar? Correct. And you said you were present there on December 26th of 2022? Yes. Uh, can you please describe uh, what was going on that day before police responded to the scene? Um, it was pretty quiet, normal. Um, I didn't have to work that day, so I was over there. I had to go get my hair done, so about 6 o'clock I left and went to go get my hair done. Is that 6 o'clock uh, a.m. or p.m.? P.m. So you left to go get your hair done around 6 um, o'clock in the evening. Uh, did you come back? I did. Um, and at that time, what time was it when you came back? I'm not really precise on the time, but it was like between 9.30, maybe 10 o'clock. And so before you left to get your hair done, did you, was there anything unusual that happened that day? Not that I can recall. And then you get back around, you say 9.30 or 10 o'clock, uh, back to 43 Canton. Correct. And when you arrived um, at that time, was there anything unusual or out of the ordinary? No. And who else was at your daughter's place when you got there? Um, she had a friend there and it was her and my granddaughter. How old is your granddaughter? How old was she at that time? Six. And who was the friend? Um, some guy my daughter had over there. I don't really know. So then it was just you, your daughter, your daughter's friend, um, and your granddaughter? Correct. So then what happens after you arrive back there around 9.30 or 10? Um, I go in the house and um, I sit in the living room, which is the two front windows in the chair and um you're saying the two front windows uh in that's the, the living room yes 
those, yeah, that's the living room. And you're indicating these photos on the right side of the house? Correct. Who else is in the living room? Was it just you? Uh, my daughter and her friend. And how about uh, your granddaughter? Where she was she? upstairs in her room playing. And at that time, did you hear anything unusual? No. Uh, did you, had you heard any arguments, anything that you remember at that time? No, it was fairly quiet. And you said that you've been at that house before at 43 Canton? Correct. Can you often hear what's going on next door? I mean, are the walls thin or not so much? Or how would you describe that? I, we could hear what was going on in each other's apartments because the walls are very thin. It's but on that day, when you arrived back there, you didn't hear anything unusual? No. And what happened next? I um, sat down in the chair, got settled in, I would say maybe 10 minutes. Um, my stomach began to hurt and I felt like I was going to get physically sick. Um, and I wanted to tell my daughter, but I felt like if I got up or said anything that I would get sick. So I just sat in the chair and once I put my head back, I just heard shots ring out. How many shots did you hear? Three. Where were they coming from? I thought they were shooting in my daughter's house. What it, makes you it, say that? Because it was so close, like I could tell they were right outside of that window. And uh, you said you heard three shots? Yeah. And can you describe to the jury, um, were those shots, were they loud, were they not loud? How would you describe them? They were loud, like I thought they were shooting in my daughter's house and I just slumped down in a chair to try to get on the floor. Um, my daughter friend laid down on the floor and my daughter got on the floor and crawled up the steps to her baby. At that time, um, did you see anyone outside? No. Uh, were, your, were there blinds in that house or yeah, curtains we, or what was there? She had blinds and curtains and they were closed. They were closed. It was night, so. And you said you heard three shots. Can you describe to the jury, were they close together? Was there a break in time between the shots? Can it was like that? pow, 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 right after one another. Uh, did it sound like it was from the same gun? Did they sound the same or did they sound different? To me, it sounded the same, like it was from one gun. That it was from one gun? Correct. So after you got on the ground and your daughter's friend got on the ground and your daughter went up to check on your granddaughter, what happened next? Um, we were pretty much frozen. Um, I um, called upstairs to my daughter to make sure my they were okay. And I was afraid to open the door or look out the window, so I did it. I would say maybe 40 seconds, 50 seconds pass maybe. And um, her, my daughter friend went to the door. He said he wanted to check on his car to see if his windows were shot out. And when he opened the door, I went behind him. And I never looked next door at the door. I was really afraid to like step out. So I just kind of stood in the doorway. And then I um, noticed a car going by kind of slowly. It was a black car with tinted windows. And did you notice anything else about that car? Just, it was a man driving. You, you said it was a black car? Yeah. We, uh, can you describe it in any more detail? Do you know what um, kind of car it was? It was like a four-door. Um, I don't know what kind of car it was. And when you came out the door at that time, did you see anyone on foot? No. Uh, did you see anyone walking in the area? No, and I wasn't looking for it. I'm not. I'm going to be honest. And did you see anyone running in the area? <laughs> no. Um, you just said you saw a black car and do you have any information that vehicle was involved or related to this or was it just driving by? No, I don't have any information that it was involved. It was just, to me, just driving by. You just remember it being there? Yes. Did you notice anything else unusual about that car? 
Just it had dark tinted windows. In which direction was it going? Um, if you look at the screen, it was traveling toward the vehicle in the driveway, toward the vision, instead of toward Maya's house. And I'm going to put up on here on the overhead at this time. Um, and before I do that, Your Honor, may the record reflect um, that Mr. Kirkhoff has um, stipulated to People's Exhibits 6 through 21. It shall. Uh, Mr. Kirkhoff did that when you were present, but uh, he's agreed to the admission of Exhibit 6 through 21 and 1 through 5 have already been admitted evidence. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, also, Your Honor, uh, I believe Mr. Kirkhoff stipulates the People's Exhibit 24, which is a map of the addresses on Canton Street, and the people would move for its admission. Any objection? No. 24 is admission. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Ms. Atkinson, I'm going to put up here on the overhead um, just a map um, of addresses from Canton Street. <coughs> Can you see that okay? I know it's a little far away. And then there's also a poster board behind you, and that is the same photograph. Okay. And so up here, uh, where it says 43, it's on Canton. Is that where your daughter lived? Correct. And you said that you saw that black car going towards which street? Um, it was going toward Division. So if you pass... 43, it'll go 39, 35, 31, 27, toward division. Okay, so what happens next? So you said you, that's the time that you open the door, you follow your daughter's friend, kind of how, um, and then what else do you do with that? Um, so at that time, my daughter comes downstairs, and I tell her to knock on the people's door to see if they're okay next door. And she looks over there and she says, Mom, they got a bullet hole in the door. And was that there before? No. So I tell her to knock on the door, just reach around and knock on the door because at that point she was afraid. And so I said, just reach around and knock on the door and see if anybody answered. And she said, I hear the kids screaming. And at that time, I got on the phone, I called 911. But in the process of calling 911, I felt like I needed to go over there and help them. So I told my daughter, I'm gonna go over there. And um, I came out the house and the door was shut. I could hear the kids screaming. I um, tried to open the door. And um, at that time, was I couldn't, it was shut. At that time or it was, was open? It was shut and it, it was shut. I, her boyfriend, Omar, came to the door and said, my girlfriend need help. And so I, I couldn't get in because he kind of opened it and cracked the door like, so I pushed the door to go in to try to help them. And uh, when I got in there, her eyes were um, dilated and she had blood coming out of her temple. And I checked her pulse and she didn't have a pulse. So he was frantic. He was standing in the living room with uh, no shirt on and some jogging pants and some socks. And um, the kids were screaming and he kept saying, help my girlfriend, help her. And I told him I couldn't help her, that she was already gone. And so um, I told him that I would take the kids because the little boy was standing at the bottom of the steps, <laughs> looking at his mother. And the little girl was at the top of the steps screaming. 
So I didn't want to contaminate the scene by crossing over Maya, so I just told him to give me the kids and he got the kids and gave them to me and we went next door to my daughter house. And was Omar saying anything else to you in that time besides he just, help her? He just kept saying, can we put her in your car and take her to the hospital? And I was like, we can't. So then did you take the kids next door? I did. And do you know where Omar went at that time? Well, he was afraid because he thought whoever had shot through the door was going to come back. So he kept saying he got to hide. And he was asking us if he could come over there. And I was like, no. So he went back in the house and shut the door and locked it. So he never came inside 43 Canton? No. So he went back to 47? Is that right? Yes. So at, at any point in time before you heard those three shots, uh, did you hear any argument between anyone? No. Did you hear any discussion outside between anyone? No. Did you hear any voices at all? Before the shots? No. Did your daughter have any video cameras, you know, set up on the outside of her house? No. Uh, and do you know, or have you ever seen if there were video cameras at 47 Canton where Maya lived? No. So to your knowledge, there just aren't any? No, ma'am. And you said that you called the police. Uh, did you uh, stay on scene until police arrived? I did. And then did you speak with them when they arrived? I did. Um, did your daughter stay as well? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Atkinson. I'm sorry for your loss, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. You sure got any questions for this witness? Yes. You said that you had no information that this black car you saw going by was involved in the shooting, correct? Correct. You had no information that the black car wasn't involved in the shooting? Correct. So it could have been or it couldn't have been. You, there's just nothing that you, all you did was look, see it drive by, right? Correct. Right after the shooting? Correct. You don't know if it was involved or not? No. No other question. Anything else, Mr. Red? Um, yes, Your Honor. Ms. Atkinson, it's not unusual for cars to drive up and down Canton Street, is that correct? No, it isn't. I mean, it's an open street, right? And it's pretty busy at times. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Ma'am, thank you. You're excused. Thank you. Uh, next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The people's next witness is Erica Shanice Atkinson, who is available on Zoom. Okay. Let's see if we can get that hooked up. Uh, good, good morning, uh, young lady. I'm Judge Quist. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, you're loud and clear as well. Um, it's been stipulated that you can testify by Zoom in this matter, so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to swear you in as a witness at, that, at this time. Do you understand? Yes. All right, please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. All right, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Beth. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Atkinson. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Atkinson, my name is Bonnie Corbett. I'm one of the assistant prosecutors, and I'm just going to ask you some questions at this time, okay? Um, and please just make sure to voice your answers um, just out loud um, so we can make sure that everything is being recorded, okay? 
Okay. Thank you. Um, and can you please tell us your name and also spell it for the record? My name is Erica Atkinson. E R I C K A A T K I N S O N. And what is your middle name? Shanice, I'm sorry. S H A N I C E. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Atkinson, uh, back on December 26th of 2022, were you living in the Grand Rapids area? Yes, ma'am. Where were you living at? At 43 Canton. How long have you lived there? Um, for about two and a half years. Who did you live there with? Um, myself and my daughter. Did you know the neighbors uh, at 47 Canton? Yeah, I did know them because they were my neighbors. And who lived there? Um, Maya, her children, and Omar. And were you home on the day of this incident, on December 26th of 2022? Yes, ma'am. Can you please describe for us uh, what you remember happening before the police arrived that night? Um, me, my mom, and my friend, we were sitting in my living room. Um, while we were sitting there, we hear shots go off. We hear about three or four shots go off. Um, and you said and how, many, how many did you hear? Um, about three or four. I believe it was three. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so after I hear the shot, I immediately get down on the ground. I look down because it seemed to be really close. Um, right after the shots, I thought about my daughter. I ran upstairs. I go check on her. Um, she was still asleep. And um, that's when I looked out the window. Um, I seen a car riding past, um, and there was a truck up the street. I seen the truck. Um, after after I look out my window um, and I go back downstairs, I open up my front door. I look outside. I don't see anyone. I look over at Miles in the door, and I see a bullet hole in the door. And I immediately tell my mom, like, there's a bullet hole in the door. She's like, check on him. I get to knock in on their door, there was no answer. Um, and so I got to knock in harder, and then I hear kids crying. And um, Omar answered me from upstairs. He asked, who was it? I told him that it was the neighbor, and I asked, was everything okay? And that's when he told me to call the police. So I just immediately called the police. Um, Omar comes down to the door, asks, can we get the kids? We get the kids out the house. Um, over to my house. Uh, he was hysterical and in shock at the time. He was just like really panicky, asking for help, asking to take her to the hospital. Um, so we look in through their door. We see her on the on the ground, and that's when I immediately run back out, go to my house, try to explain to the police the best way I could what was happening. And um, I called one of her friends that I knew, knew her and her family, so I had to be notified of it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take you back um, and just unpack that a little bit, okay? Uh, so when you okay. said that you heard three to four shots, you said they sounded close, correct? Correct. And what do you mean by that? Where did it sound like they were coming from? Could you tell? Outside. It was definitely coming from outside. Um, it sounded like it was right in front of my window. That's it, like they had to be right in front of my window. It was so loud. Before you heard those shots, did you see anyone approach your house? No, I didn't see anyone. We were watching TV, listening to music at the time, so I wasn't really looking outside my windows or anything like that. I just heard the shots go off. And so you did not see anyone approach Maya's house, correct? No, no, I didn't. Before the shots went off, did you hear anything unusual? Like an argument, a discussion, anything? No, there was no argument. There was no ruckus or anything like that next door. So. Um, and you said after the shots went off, at some point you looked out your window. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And so was that after you had checked on your daughter? Yeah. So you did not look out the window immediately, is that correct? No, no, I didn't. So how much time would you say passed between the time that you heard the shots and the time you looked out the window? 
uh, uh, not even 60 seconds. It's not even 60 seconds. Immediately after the shots went off, I dug down and I thought about my daughter. I ran upstairs immediately and um, flipped on my light. She was still sleeping, and so I went straight to the window. And so you said about 60 seconds after the shots went off, you looked out the window. Mm -hmm. Was that right? Yes, ma'am. And was that the upstairs window, downstairs? Upstairs. And so immediately after the shots went off, you did not see anyone, correct? No, no. Um, at any point in time, um, did you see anyone on foot in the area, walking or running? No, ma'am. Um, you mentioned that after that 60 seconds had passed, and that you looked out the window, you saw a car pass by? Yeah, it was a dark early vehicle. Uh, do you remember anything else about it? Um, I just remember uh, there was one person in the car, clearly, it was the driver, and it just, what made me think about it was because he was riding really slow. They were riding, they were riding really slow, and all you could see was the lights um, from the, like, the dashboard of the car, and you could see the driver's chest area, and they were looking at our house, and they were driving really slow, but they were looking towards our house, and that's what I noticed. And that was about a minute after the gunshots went off? Yeah. Um, and did you ever see that person, the driver, or do you know who that was? No, ma'am. Um, did you see anything else unusual about that vehicle? Um, no. Um, like I told the police that night, um, as the car was driving past, I did notice that the truck, it was a truck, I can't remember the color, or it was an SUV, it was an SUV up the street, and once that car turned left on um, Ionia, I noticed that the truck backed up and followed behind the car. And do you know if they were related um, to each no, other in any way? I don't know, I'm sorry. So you just don't know anything else about those vehicles? Yeah. Um, and was the street open to the public at that time? Yes. And was it normal for cars to drive up and down Canton? Yeah. Did you notice anything about the driver? You said a truck. What do you mean by truck? What type of truck? Like an SUV truck. And you, did you see the driver or anything like that? No. And so you just have no idea who was driving those cars or what they were doing? No, ma'am. You said that you heard uh, three to four shots, correct? Yes. Uh, can you please describe for the jury, were those shots close in time? Were they spread out? Can you please describe that to the best of your memory? They were one right after me, one right after me. It was about three, three or four shots that I can remember. It was three, but they were right after each other. Right after each other. Three of them. That was it. Did they sound different, or did they sound like they were from the same gun, or what? Yeah, it, it sounded like it was from the same gun. It didn't sound like it was multiple guns or anything. Walking or running in the area. No, ma'am. 
Uh, and you're here testifying on Zoom today. Uh, do you not live out of state? Here. Uh, does it have anything to do with this incident? Um, somewhat. Um, I did have people, a few people come to my house and like tell me that they were looking for Omar, they were looking for people, and um, that my house was going to get shot up and things like that. So, yeah, it, I, I mean, I've been playing the rules with that and kind of the rush on things. I just put a rush on it? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Atkinson. I have no other questions right now. All right, Mr. Krugoff, do you have any questions for Ms. Atkinson? After this incident, there were people looking for Omar? Yes, I mean, that's what I was told. I'm not sure. I have no other Anything else, Mr. Bat? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Atkinson, thank you very much for appearing today. We're all set with your testimony. Your excuses are ready, all right? Thank you. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Have a good day. Thank you. All right, next witness, please. There are the people called Jennifer Stranelak. Jennifer Stradilak, J E N N I F E R, Stradilak, S T R A T E L A K. And can you tell the jury your occupation, please? I'm a crime scene technician with Grand Rapids Police Department. How long have you been a crime scene technician? Since 2016. Did, uh, is there training, extensive training associated with that occupation? Yes, there is. And you've successfully completed all of that training to do this job? Yes, I did. And how long have you worked for Grand Rapids that entire time? Uh, yes, and then an internship a year before. Where was that? Also at Grand Rapids Police Department. Okay. Could you, for those that might not have ever seen uh, crime and dramas on TV, and that's probably not accurate, can you briefly describe to the jury what a crime scene technician's role is at, a, at an incident? Yep. So I respond to crime scenes where I document, collect, and preserve evidence. Direct your attention back to um, December 26th of 2022, uh, did you receive, did you get dispatched to locations similar to the way a, a law enforcement officer would? Yes, I do. Were you dispatched to the area of 47 Canton Street? Yes, I was. And that's in, that is in the city of Grand Rapids, correct? Uh, yes. And uh, do you recall on that evening what time approximately you would have been, would, you would have received that dispatch call? Uh, shortly after 10 p.m. And did you, did you head to that location immediately? Yes, I did. Describe, if you would, what the scene, what was going on at the scene upon your arrival. Uh, once I arrived on scene, I got briefed by officers, um, and then I searched for evidence, talked to the detectives, um, and then I started processing the scene is what we call it, so photographing, marking evidence, photographing some more. It was pretty snowy, so. We had to search for evidence and um, use different things to be able to search for that evidence. Was it snowing that uh, at, at the time when you arrived, or had it snowed? Uh, it had snowed. Describe the, you know, there's like a pristine area of snow, and then there's a, a tracked up area of snow. Uh, how would you describe the snow in front of the, the building that contains 47 and 43 candles? Um, there was a lot of disturbance in the snow. As part, as part of your role as a crime scene technician, if you saw clear, distinct tracks leading to or from the house, would you have taken note of that? Yes, I would have. What would you have done with that? I would have photographed it, and then I would have used a scale to be able to show the uh, footwear impression in the snow. And, and so photographing that, taking a measurement so that uh, it would have some evidentiary value? Yes. So, 
Is there any, you didn't observe any identifiable tracks that were distinct leading to or from the residence? That's correct. <clears throat> so I want to take you through your activities that night as a, as a crime scene technician. Um, and I'll start with the, did you process the, the threshold, the landing leading up to the front door of 47 Canton? Yes, I photographed it. Photographed it, and uh, beyond that, what did you do? Uh, what did you observe? And if you did see anything of evidentiary value, I'd like you to outline that for the jury. Yep. Um, we noticed when we were searching that there were um, some defects in the wall and the door, um, and we marked those with triangles and scales. When you say defects, um, what, how would you characterize that in, in layman's terms? Um, just a marking. Um, it could be a possible bullet hole. It could be um, just something that we describe as something off. All right. I'm showing Exhibit 14 on the, uh, on the screen. Here, do you recognize that? Yes, that is the front of the residence. And with the laser pointer, do you have there? If you can show the jury what you said, uh, mark, marking the scene. Is there an example of a marking? Yep. So right here, you can see that little triangle. It's yellow. So we put that on my partner and I. Okay. So that triangle that you had on the door to 47 Kent and the left door in Exhibit 14. Yes. Uh, that's an evidence marker? It's a triangle, yes. Okay. And so I'm going to show you next is a close-up of that image. <coughs> Exhibit 7. And can you tell the jury what we're looking at here? That is a close-up of that triangle A of the door. And you describe that as a defect? Yeah, it's a perforation, so it actually goes through the door. If it does, if, if a, let's say that that is a, a, a bullet impact, if it doesn't go all the way through, it's not, it's not called a perforation, what would it be called? A penetration. So perforation means all the way through? Yes. Okay. Uh, so on the other side of the door, there would be a corresponding uh, exit through the door. That's correct. Showing exhibit 18. I don't know if there's a way to zoom. So you have the peephole in the center there of uh, uh, Exhibit 18. Yep. What is that marking over to the left of that? So this is a scale right here that I put on, and it says A exit. So on the other side of that would be A entrance, or the, the, the yellow triangle? Yep. Yes. Uh, how did you determine whether the bullet went from outside in or inside out? Um, we used a probe, and we also were able to determine it based on um, what the interior and the exterior looked like. So what, uh, what did this appear to you? Uh, was the bullet fired from inside out or outside in? Uh, outside to inside. And is that, is that a metal door? Yes. So going back to the front again, uh, I want to talk. So how many, how many letter markings do you have? Uh, we had one triangle and we had a few scales. I'm sorry, we had two triangles and a couple of scales. I'm going to move to marker or triangle B. So when you exhibit eight, <coughs> what are we looking at here? So we're looking at that front porch again, and then we're looking at this blue shovel with that triangle B right here. And that's in front, that's actually in front of 43 Canton store, correct? To the right of it? That's correct. Okay. Um, is that, a, is that a perforation through the, through the shovels? Yes, that's correct. It's a perforation. It goes through. Was there any defect in the, in the brick wall behind it? There was a possible defect. The, there, it hits another shovel that's, under the earth that's behind it and then a defect to the wall. Did you find a, a projectile behind there? We did not. Uh, same question as it relates to triangle A through the house. 
Uh, was there a projectile? Was there any projectile uh, recovered from inside the house? No. Was there any uh, through the perforation of triangle A through the door? Was there any corresponding defect on any of the walls inside the residence, 47 Camden? No, there was not. Did you find any projectiles at all during your search and processing of the scene? No, I did not. Now I'm going to move to uh, to C. <clears throat> Showing you exhibit nine. Talk about C and D. Can you show the jury uh, where C and D are in terms of markings? Yes. Um, we have a scale right here, which is C, and then we have a scale right here on that door frame, and that's scale D. So, for the record, on Exhibit Nine, uh, you indicated scale C was on the, uh, the the metal threshold at the base of the door. In the wood, yes. Uh, near near the center of the base of the door. Yes. And then. Sticker D, you had indicated uh, in the door, basically the door jam slightly below the, the door handle. Yes. Okay. Um, any any projectiles were, were those perforations or penetrations? Um, this one right here, that's D, was a perforation, and then this right here was a defect. A defect. Yes. Okay. Any projectiles recovered from either of those locations? No. You said a perforation for marker or for a sticker D. Is there a corresponding uh, exit through the through the wall or through the door? Yes, there is. And did, did it, was there a search inside the house for a logical uh, end of the trajectory of that? Uh, if it was a projectile? Yes. Yes, we did search. Did you find anything? We did not. And. For uh, sticker C, a penetration into the metal or into the wood? It was a defect. A defect. Yes, defect. So do you, can you say with certain, do you know based on your, uh, your crime scene processing uh, when any of those uh, defects were made? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Is there any way to <laughs> determine when those defects were made? When? No. We okay. can. We can kind of look if they're older or younger, but we can't say an actual timestamp on when those are made. Okay. And can we zoom in on, uh, or we have another, another photo of C. Okay, and this is on the threshold at the base of the door, correct? Correct. And using the laser pointer, there seems to be like a metallic object uh, in, in the wood near the... Referring to this? That, that, that area right there at the center, top third of exhibit 10. Mm -hmm. uh, was that, is, do you know if that had the, the appearance of a bullet fragment or...? Um, it potentially looks like it from here, but once we searched it, what's not? Okay. And you don't, you don't know when that was, when that defect was made? No, I do not. You just processed it as, as potential evidence? That's correct. Okay. All right, um, can we show a close-up of sticker D? And show the jury what we're looking at here. Okay, this is scale D right here, and then we can see this perforation, so it goes through. This is from the outside, or this is the exterior of that door frame. And there is a corresponding uh, interior uh, defect? Yeah, exit, yes. Okay. For the uh, for the perforations, are there probe rods that you would employ as a crime scene technician to show uh, the path through the object? Uh, yes, we insert probes if we're able to in perforations. Were those done in this case? Yes. So starting with uh, perforation triangle A. Show the jury what we're looking at here. Uh, 
Um, this is again that perforation um, from the door, triangle A, you can see, and this is a probe, what we call a probe, that I have inserted. And what's the purpose of that? Uh, to show a possible path um, of the bullet. It's difficult to tell in this, uh, in this photograph, so I'm, I'll use I'll use this as the door <laughs> that uh, triangle A is on, and you can use my pen. So if this is the door, can you show the jury the orientation of that probe? Uh, and by orientation I mean, is it upward, downward, is it horizontal, and then is it square, or does it, uh, does it orient left or right? Does that make sense? Yes. So for A, if you can see right there, um, it is slightly like this. So it's pointing in a um, southeast, which would be over here, to northwest direction. Fairly parallel to the ground? Um, yes, slightly up. Wh which end was slightly up? Go going up. It was slightly so. It was going in an upward direction. Okay. But and then... from southeast to northwest. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I guess while I'm standing here, if we could bring up the exhibit for the probe on perforation D. And same door, same same probe, same question. Okay. Let's try it out. Okay, so scale D, which is on that door frame right there, um, you can see, again, it's going to be that southeast to northwest direction, as you can kind of see. It's actually going to go downward a little bit. Saw that? All right. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I'm here. Also, I'm going to publish Exhibit 13. <coughs> was a crime scene sketch done in relation to this case? Yes, it was. is both published uh, we can make a zoom out. published on the wall and also on the, the, the physical image uh, behind the, the witness stand. Can you walk the jury through uh, this crime scene sketch? Yes, I can. So this is a sketch or a diagram that my partner completed based on the rough sketch of the scene. Um, you can see his initials here, the north um, arrow, the legend, so you can see right here, one through three, or actually right here, it says casings. And then we see marker four, which is right here, it's marker four. And then we have um, these triangles right here, which we have put right here. Okay. Uh, let's talk about casings. Okay. Um, did you search for shell casings? Yes, my partner and I did. Okay. How, uh, how thoroughly did you search for shell casings? Very thoroughly. Uh, tell the jury where, uh, where you searched and if you found any, where you found those. We searched the porch, the front porch, the sidewalk that was snow covered, the uh, front lawn that was snow covered, the roadway in front. Um, we used metal detectors and lights to be able to um, try and find these casings. Why did you have to use metal detectors? Um, sometimes when casings um, come out of guns, they're pretty hot. And if they go on uh, snow, it can actually melt. So we're not able to see it on top of the snow. Sometimes it, it's all the way at the bottom or it's in the snow somewhere. So we need a metal detector to aid in our search. And uh, were shell casings found in this case? Yes, we did locate them. And where were they located? <clears throat> they were um, just south of that sidewalk in front of the porch. All right, and on uh, exhibit 13 here, uh, does, does that show the location of the three shell casings that were found? Yes, it does, right here. So in the center uh, and with square markers one, two, and three? Yes, uh, that's Square correct. markers on, uh, as they are on the exhibit? Yes. In, uh, at the scene, what do the markers look like? The little tent cards that we use. So showing. Zoom in on the snow in front. 
when you talked about the snow being tracked up, was that uh, is that an accurate portrayal of the snow? Yes. And the three, uh, they look like cones in the bottom right? Yep, so in this case we use um, yellow cones um, as our markers. So let me ask you this. You, you processed and identified four defects. Yes. You found three shell casings. That's correct. How thoroughly did you look we, uh, for other shell casings? Uh, we looked pretty hard for those. Okay. And you only, you only found three in the entire scene? Yes. Exhibit 15 uh, is on the board here, and it, it appears. Uh, are you? Are we looking east toward uh, toward division there? Yes, we are. And uh, markers one, two, and three are visible in this image. Yes, right here. Is there any uh, relevance to the numbering? Can you tell from the crime scene which one was deposited first? No, we cannot. So as you see them, you mark them. Yes. Sidebar counsel. Casing is um, what's left behind after a bullet goes out of a gun. And the, do they do all pistols eject shell casings? No. Do you know the difference between a revolver and a, and a semi-automatic? <coughs> yes, I do. Do revolvers automatically eject that uh, the, the brass shell casing? No, they do not. How so? How do you? How would one remove shell casings from a revolver? They would have to manually take the cylinder out and then take the casings out of it, or cartridges that are still left behind. And how are shell casings ejected from a semi-automatic pistol? Uh, once it's gone, it, it automatically cycles, and the casing actually gets ejected out of the gun. And that happens automatically? Yes, it does. So that's the portion of the bullet, that, that's the portion of the entire projectile, uh, minus the bullet that travels through the barrel? Yes. Yes, it was. Were there any other um, evidence markers or any other pieces of evidence taken from inside the residence? Yes, there was. 
Uh, describe what those were. Um, we had a couple of cell phones the detectives located and asked to be photographed, documented, and collected. Um, also a tablet that we located and uh, documented and collected. So those electronic devices, were those taken because they had apparent evidentiary value or the detectives told you to, to, to take those? The detectives asked and so we collected them. Did you find any, any, any weapons, any ammunition, any, any shell casings, anything firearm related uh, inside the residence? I did not. Did anybody else to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. Is there any signs of a weapon being fired indoors? No. As it relates to the shell casings, um, in the record reflect I'm showing defense counsel. Post exhibit 16 which might have already been admitted. Exhibit 16 it has been admitted. Okay. Mr. Adler, can you open up the envelope, uh, Exhibit 16? three um, FC 9mm Luger, Luger casings that are located at markers 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And uh, they're, so they're each in an individual smaller envelope? Yes, they are. Can I show the jury? Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, what caliber are all three of those shell casings? 9mm. 9mm? 9mm, yes. And where, is, where would that be indicated on the shell casing? Um, it's on the head stamp of the casing. And could you just pick one of the three? and uh, take it out of the envelope. I don't want to get it mixed up. And then if you could, since you have your glove on, if you could uh, maybe walk, uh, walk in front of the jury slowly so that they can see this head stamp marking on the back of the shell casing. Any objection, Mr. Kirkwell? No. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. What, uh, and just for the record, what does the, can you read all of the information that's on the back of that round? Yep, the head stamp says FC 9mm Luger. And so 9mm Luger would be the caliber? Yes. And FC, what is that? Uh, possibly a brand. Federal cartridge, perhaps? Perhaps. Did you do anything in terms of latent print processing? to see if there were any identifiable fingerprints on the shell cases? Yes, I did. How did you do that? I processed them um, with super glue fuming, um, and then it becomes super glue when it's mixed in with water and, it has, um, and it's heated, actually becomes a vapor. It can stick to fingerprints on surfaces, and that's the um, process I used. And you've been trained uh, and successfully passed all the training for uh, latent print processing? Yes. And you used all of those procedures in this case? Yes. Did you find any identify or any 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 uh, fingerprint uh, impressions that would have had that would have been useful for processing? Uh, it was negative for the imprints. 
How common is it would, it would it be to get fingerprints off of a shell, a fired shell casing? Uh, not very common. Why is that? Um, many reasons. Um, I'm not a firearm examiner, okay. so I don't want to say. Was there any finger? Did you did you do any fingerprinting, or did a crime, another crime scene technician do any uh, fingerprint processing of the door? I believe my partner did. Do you know the results of that? No, I do not. One moment, Your Honor. Thank you very much, Mr. I've got no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Mr. Sturkoff, any questions? Just a few The bullet hole that was found in the shovel was, that shovel was situated in front of 23 camp, correct? Correct. And that was uh, I'm a, sorry, did you say 23? I'm sorry, uh, 43, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, 43 is correct, not yes. 23. And it was, uh, that's in a different direction than the other three holes that were found, correct? Possibly, we didn't, we weren't able to put a probe through it. from that date states that you collected GSR on the hands of Omar Dan on that date. Do you remember that? I do. What does GSR stand for? Gunshot residue. No further questions. Anything else for this witness, Mr. Favor? In relation to gunshot residue, uh, whose direction was it to take gunshot residue off of uh, Omar Dan? Um, it was at the request of MCT detectives. Is that common in shooting, uh, shooting scenes? Yes, it is. Um, no further questions. Anything else for this witness, Mr. Kirkup? No, you're excused, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want me to put these away? What? Do you want me to put these away? Or? Uh, talk to the prosecutor. Nothing else for the witness. <laughs> oh, if, if you could please put them all back in the way. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, we have one more short witness before our new break. I believe so. All right, let's do that. Uh, the people call Officer Darian Adams. Yeah, thank you. My name is Darian Adams, D-A-R-I-A-N-A-D-A-M-S. Thank you. How are you currently employed? Uh, by the Grand Rapids Police Department as a police officer. How long have you worked in that capacity? Uh, two years now. What was your assignment back on the day of this incident on December 26th of 2022? Uh, I was given the assignment of canvassing the north side of Canton. And so were you dispatched to the scene at 47 Canton Street? Yeah, it came out as a shots fired, so everyone kind of in that service area started heading that way. Did a lot of officers respond that night? Yes. And what was your primary role on scene that day? Just to canvass uh, the north side of that street. And that would have been the north side of Canton? Yes. Uh, were there other officers involved in the canvas of other areas? Correct. Uh, did other officers canvas the area of Ionia Avenue Southwest? I do not recall. Uh, did other officers canvas businesses in that area? I don't, I don't. I can only speak to what I did. And you were mainly involved in the canvas of the north side of Canton Street? Correct. Uh, did you speak to a lot of the residents on Canton Street? Um, I spoke to some residents, and then I know that there were a few houses that didn't answer. And did any of the residents on Canton Street have exterior video surveillance? 
Yes, I recall that two of the addresses that I spoke with had surveillance. And are you familiar with the layout of Canton Street and the uh, general addresses in that area? Yeah. Um, can you please, is the laser pointer still up there? I think it'd be up standing right there. Um, you just push the button and aim it up there. Could you indicate for the jury which two houses that you just identified had some video surveillance? So 31 and then 23. Did you watch that video surveillance? Um, the, the, in my report, I wrote that 31 had a ring camera, but they didn't have, it didn't capture anything of note. Um, so 31 did not have any exterior video surveillance related to this case? Correct. And then about 23 can? 23 did, and I did review that footage. And so you had a chance to watch it? Yes. Uh, and then is that something that you would personally collect, that video, or is that something that detectives would follow up on? De the detectives would follow up on it. Uh, but you made a note that you watched it in your report? <clears throat> yes. And did you actually speak with a resident at that location? Uh, the residents at that location spoke fluent Spanish. Um, so another officer was the one that actually spoke with them. Was that Roberto Augustin? Is that the resident there, if you recall? Yes. And how about 20 Canton? Uh, do you see that on here? I do. Uh, can you indicate that for the jury with the laser pointer? Uh, was there any video surveillance at that location? I was not involved in any of the canvassing on the south side of the street. And so then did you know, did you find any other noteworthy video surveillance during your canvas on Canton? No, the only one of note was what I witnessed at 23 Canton. 23 Canton. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any additional involvement in this investigation? We just remained on scene as scene security for the perimeter position on the east side of Canton. And so you did not collect any evidence, is that correct? Correct. <coughs> As it relates to the video that you watched at um, 23 Canton, when you observed that video, um, was the time stamp <coughs> that was visible on that video, was that accurate? It was not. Can you please describe that? Um, so while I was looking at the video footage, I was trying to relate it to the time frame that we know the incident occurred. Um, the camera footage that I was looking at had a timestamp of 0, 0300 hours, and um, <coughs> the time frame that we were looking at was 2150. And did the resident there confirm that the timestamp on there was not the, the accurate time? They did. Thank you, Officer Adams. I have no further questions. Anything for this witness, Mr. Kirkoff? No questions. Okay. You're excused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's nearly quarter to 12. This will be your lunch break. I'll let you back here promptly at 1 o'clock. We're going to try to keep plugging away right at 1 p.m., okay? Uh, thank you. All rise to the next the jury.
and we have to bring one a little bit early, okay? Yes, Your Honor, we do already plan on bringing one that was scheduled for tomorrow and today, but I believe we're still on track for Thursday. Okay, very good. Anything else, Mr. Kirkhoff, before we go off the record for a lunch break? No, Your Honor. All right, very good. Thank you. See you guys at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Yes. You will lock the doors, right? Uh, Stacy will lock the door. Okay. <laughs> the boss. The boss. The boss. I'm going off the record. <laughs>
right, be seated, please. Uh, Mr. Prevett, anything before we bring the jury back in? No, Your Honor. Mr. Kirkhoff? No, Your Honor. All right, very good. All rise for the jury, please. Be seated, please. Ms. Rabat, next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The people call Omar Dina. Good afternoon, sir. Please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, something to God? Yes, sir. Thank you. Have a seat, please. Go ahead, Ms. Prevett. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please tell us your name and spell it for the record? My name is Omar Damon. O-M-A-R. Last name, Damon. D-A-N-N-A-H. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dana, how old are you? 24. Are you from the Grand Rapids area? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you still live in the Grand Rapids area? Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you have any children? Yes. How many? Three. And do you know Maya Kelly? Yes, ma'am. How did you know her? Kid, two, two of my kids. I have two kids with her. That's my baby mother. And what are the ages of the two children that you had with Maya? Um, five and four. How long were you in a relationship with Maya Kelly? Um, five, six years, six years, five years, six years. Um, and up here on the, on the screen, I'm going to show you a photograph that's already been admitted in this trial. This is People's Exhibit 1. Um, who is this in the photo? That's her. That's Maya. And you said you were in a relationship with her about five to six years? Yes. Were you in a relationship with her on the day of her death, on December 26th? Yes, I was. Were you present at the home when she was shot and killed? Yes, I was. Who else was there? Our kids. What were you all doing that day? Watching a movie. Do you remember approximately what time of the day or night this took place? 949. And what makes you say 949? Because I have my phone in my hand. Uh, can you just describe to the jury, give them an idea of you know, where you were at in the house, what you were all doing you know, before 949 p.m.? Um, right before 9, for, right before around that time, uh, I was upstairs. She was... Uh, 
her friend was there. She had a friend over. Uh, they was downstairs. Uh, I can't really tell you what they was doing. I was upstairs. I was with my son and um, we was just watching YouTube videos. And then uh, she had texted me at about 9.30 and told me to come downstairs and, and watch TV with her. I told her no because her friend was there. I didn't want to be in their face. And then she said she left. And then so I came downstairs with my son. So before you came downstairs, my just had what, a female friend over? Yes. Uh, what were they doing? Just hanging out? Or? Yeah. Okay, so you come downstairs around 9.30. What happens then? We was uh we was debating on what movie we was trying to, we was gonna watch. Debating on what movie we were gonna watch? Yes. <clears throat> and did you decide on a movie? Yeah, take yeah. What was it? It was uh baddies. I wasn't really watching it though. <laughs> were your kids with you? Yes. Were they in the living room with you? Yes. Both of them? Yes. So did you actually start the movie? Did you get to that point? Or did the movie not even start it? Yeah, she has started it. So what happened then? I actually did kind of like the show. It was straight. And <coughs> she was, uh, we was talking about it. I was asking her some stuff because I didn't really know about it. So then my kids, they was in front of us on a tablet. Then we something that came up on it, and then we got to laughing about it, and um, that's when a knock had happened. Somebody, somebody knocked on the door. And I didn't hear it at first because I was laughing. We was laughing, but she heard it, I guess. So then she said, "Somebody knock." I'm like, "Ain't nobody knock." Then they knocked again, and then she went to the door. How would you describe the knock, just so the jury has a good idea of that? Was it loud, was it not loud? How would you describe the knock? The first one wasn't loud, because I didn't hear it. The second one was just uh, hearable. Uh, did you hear any voices at that time? No, not with the knock, no. I'm sorry? Not with the knock, no. I just have to make sure you speak loud enough, okay? Just so <coughs> they can hear you, okay? Um. Uh, so what happened then? You said Maya went to answer the door? Yes. Can you please tell us what happened then? She she, <clears throat> she asked who was it. And then uh, it was like some mumble words. I don't know who it was. I didn't hear I didn't it wasn't a fam I didn't hear no I didn't hear the a familiar voice. But Maya did she she actually said who is it? Yes. Were those her words? Yes. And you said that there was a voice that responded? Yes. Did you recognize that voice? No, I did not recognize the voice. Did it sound like a male or female? I, I don't know. I didn't recognize Like, it wasn't like, I don't know. Um, can you tell us the best um, of your memory? What, what were the words being said? Did you understand any of it? Um, it's... it's Whatever it was, said it's somebody, but like it was like it's, and then it said something like mumble, some type of mumble name, I don't know, or something like that, I don't know. I can't really, it wasn't, it was like, I couldn't make it out for real. I just heard them talking. So you did not recognize the voice? No. Did you know who it was at that time? No. So you told us already that Maya originally said, who's there, or who is it? Right. Um, did she say anything else to that person? Did they have a conversation? She said, who is it again? She was like, who? And then what did the other person say? They mumbled something else. Uh, could you hear those words? No. And what happened next? She looked at me and said, she thought it was her brother. She like this. She like, Omar, this got to be Robert or somebody playing. It's got to be someone playing? Y yeah, she named her brother. She was like, this got to be Robert or somebody playing. In, in that voice, you said that you couldn't really understand the words, but was that voice on the other side of the door loud? No. Can, can you please help the jury understand the best you can? How did that voice sound? Mm 
And by that, I mean, can you give any details? Was it soft spoken? Was it loud? Was it angry? Soft spoken, regularly. Was there anything unusual about it? Weird about it? Yeah, because it was it wasn't recognizable, so that's weird. Because you had spoke to the officers about that voice before, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and you said it, it sounded weird. Yeah. And so, what did you mean by weird? Like, like somebody was trying to mimic a voice. Mimic a voice. Like that. So then Maya turns to you and says something about she thinks they're playing. Yes. What happens next? I heard the, the last word playing was like cut off by shots. Like she barely got playing out. Where were your kids when you heard the shots? My daughter was standing right next to her. My daughter walked to the door with her. And my son was laying in, um like laying on the floor right in front of me on his tablet. When Maya went towards the door, we're talking about the door, you're talking about the front door? Yes. When Maya went towards the door, did she ever open the door? Um, no. Was the door ever open? No. Did you ever tell an officer that the door was open? No. So the door was never open? Never open. You said that Maya barely got the word out. They were... She thought someone was playing. Right. And that was the last thing you heard her say? Yes. And then you heard the shots? Yes. How many shots did you hear? Three or four. Just to be clear, could you tell where they were coming from? Yes. Where? Right in the front porch, the porch. Were those shots close in time? Were they spread out? Close. Did it sound like they were from the same gun or different guns? Same. So it sounded like they were from the same gun and they were close in time? Yeah. And there were three to four shots? Yes. What happens right after you hear those shots? It wasn't no after, it was as they shot, like as the first so it was like quick instant. I just I dove on my son, and then I had ran towards Maya and my daughter. Like, and yeah, I looked up and she was she dropped. Was she saying anything at that time? No, nah, she no. Nah. <coughs> Did you ever see anyone on the porch? No. Did you see anyone on the other side of the door? No. Did you ever look through the door? <coughs> no. Uh, did you ever get really close to the door? Oh yeah, that's what I forgot to say. She looked through the people, but she ain't see nobody. I meant to say that in the in the midst of her going to the door. Before she asked who is it, she looked through the people. And she didn't see anything? She didn't see anybody. So that's, I, that's, that's another thing that, was, that, that I, I said was weird. That's another thing you said was weird? Yeah. So Maya looked through the people, but you did not. Right. So you said you, you went over to Maya, you kind of went over to your kids. Um, yeah, I dove on my son. Them. I dove on my, I dove, I didn't dive on my daughter, but like I snatched her down quick. And what did you do with your kids? I ran, uh, ran stuff, stuffed them in the closet. I mean, put them in a closet. Why? Because somebody was shooting. And did you have any idea who it was at that moment? No. Do you know whether or not that shooter left or if the shooter was still there? I wouldn't. I, I don't know. Now, did you ever look out the window or the blinds? Um, yeah, after. But right after the shots were fired, did you see anyone in the area? No. Did you see anyone on foot? No. Did you see anyone running away? No. So back on December 26th, you did not see who shot Maya? No. It 
So what happened then? Um, you told the, you told us that you took your kids and you, you put them in a closet. Yes. What, what happened yes. next? I went back to her. Uh, I just was trying to help her. What, what did you do? What did you try to do? I was like, grab, you know, just trying to talk to her, grab her, see where she was actually hit at. Well, I kind of, I knew where she was hit at. I was just, I was just trying to help her. And how did you know where she was hit at? I saw it. And after the shots, after my was shot, did she say anything to you at all? No, she was just, no. What happened next? She was just shaking. She was just, just trying to fight, I guess. And what did you do next? Did you call anyone, go anywhere? What did you do? Yeah, I called the ambulance. I tried to call the ambulance for her, but I ended up hanging up because they was just like asking me too many questions and trying to get me to stay on the phone. And my kids came out and they came out and they had uh, walked up. Um, they was, you know, they were seeing their mom like that. So I, I took them somewhere else. They both came out the closet. They were scared. They were screaming. So I took them upstairs instead of the closet this time. I took them upstairs and put them in our room. And uh, huh? You said they were scared and screaming. And yeah. Time. So then at that time you take them upstairs? Yes. And, and what happens then? <clears throat> I put them in our room and then somebody else start knocking at the door. Do you know who that person was? Not at the moment when they was knocking. So when you heard that knock, what did you do? I, I looked out the window first and I seen it was a girl and I asked who it was. So are you looking out the upstairs window or the yes, first floor? Yes, because I was upstairs putting the kids in the, and I had just got up there and put them in the room. And so did you find out who that person was? Yes. Who was it? It was our neighbor. The neighbor? Yes. And so then what did you do? I said, I said, what's up, what's up, like, yo, I said, what's up, and she, like, like, I was, I was like, who, who, like, who, like, what you, what do you want, like, like, I need help, and not really what you want, I was like, I was just kind of, like, asking her, like, yeah, like, as in, that's what I was meaning, though, like, and then she was like, are you okay, and then I was like, yeah, I need you, I need you to help me, I need you to call the ambulance, I need you to get my kids, because I couldn't talk, I was already on the phone with them, but I couldn't talk to them, they was asking for me questions. So, and it was a lot going on at the moment. So I had to tell her to do that and then ask her to get my kids so I could finish helping Maya. That was just my biggest concern. So then you were asking the neighbor for help with your kids? Yes. Um, did they end up taking your kids? Yes. Can you please tell us about that? How did that happen? I, well, I went downstairs right after that. I was like, I need you to get my kids. I need to get my kids. I didn't tell her what happened. I didn't tell her that my shot because like, it just was still like, I don't know. It was a lot going on. So I went downstairs, I opened the door for her, and I was just, I don't know, I just, I gave her, I gave, I gave her my kids, but I was still kind of like skeptical because I ain't know like, I ain't know who, who was involved, I ain't know who did, you know, so I kind of was skeptical and I, I tried to go over there with them, but she was kind of like, she, I don't think she, she wasn't trusting me, I wasn't trusting her, you know, so I'm like, uh, I ended up, I was trying to like, I don't know, I, after she got my kids or whatever, I was asking her to take me to an ambulance, to an ambulance, and she was like, why, why? Then she ended up looking, and she seen my, she seen Maya stressed, stressed out, and then she, she just started screaming and going crazy, and that's what just made me, like, made my situation worse. It made what? The situation worse for me, because that's what I was trying to prevent. I kind of already knew she was gone, but I was still trying to have, like, Faith it will help hope, I guess. So then did the police end up showing up? Yes. Uh, and were you there when the police arrived? Yes. Um, and then what happened um, with you when police arrived? They put their glocks in, in my face. Um, and then were you placed into a police cruiser at that time? Yes. Um, and did you end up speaking with an officer? Yes. Do you know of anyone who wanted to harm Maya? No, not Maya, no. Do you know of anyone who wanted to harm Maya? No. Do you know of anyone who wanted to harm Maya? No. Do you know of anyone who wanted to harm Maya? No. Do you know of anyone who
wanted to harm you? Not that I can name, not by name. You know any names? No. Nah. Remember <coughs> talking to the to the police about this, you know, whether there was anyone who wanted to harm you or if you were having problems with anyone around that time? When the police or the detectives, like when they got me to the interrogation room? Sure. That was talking about? Yeah, they was asking me people. They was asking me, did I know, do I know any people and stuff like that. And, and what names did you give them? I didn't get, they was naming people for me. Like they was naming, they was naming, they were like, do you think your, because the cause incident had happened before, a few days be, prior to this. And they were like, do you think your cousin had anything to do with it, stuff like that. And I was just like, I, I really wasn't sure. So I, I didn't want to say, oh yeah, this person did that. So I was like, I don't, I don't know who, who it could have been. Because when you were in the back of the cruiser, did that officer ask you about your cousin? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do yeah, you remember so. him asking you if uh, Terrell was involved? Yes. Is that the cousin that you're referring to? Yes. Um, and at that time you said you don't know? Yeah, because I, did, I didn't. I was like, I don't know. And so then you just mentioned something that happened the days before or the week before. What were you talking about? Uh. My, my cousin had got in some uh, some trouble or whatever, I guess, or whatever. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there, but I, I know that I was I was there, but I wasn't there. Like, I wasn't there when he showed up. But, like, I guess something happened. Um, and by the t I got the call for my girl to, to get home because she said my cousin was hurt. I got there, you know. And when I got there, the police had, like, a few minutes after I got there, the police was surrounding the house. So I never really got to know what exactly happened. What he, what he, what, what was done or what? I don't know what happened. So, I just know he got the house, the house got surrounded, and they end up making us all come out, and he ended up being locked up. So the house got surrounded. The Four, house is that you referring to? Four seven can. Yeah. Um, is that the incident that took place on December nineteenth? Yes. So on December nineteenth, your cousin Terrell got arrested from Forty Seven Canton. Correct. Is Terrell's last <laughs> name Franklin? Yes. What's his nickname or street name? I don't, I don't know. Does he go by Rao? I don't, I don't know. And so then back on December 19th, uh, were you at 47 Canton at some point on that day? Some point, yeah. And so before that day, or let me rephrase that, um, you said that Terrell is your cousin. Yeah, it's my blood cousin. Okay, so it's a biological blood cousin. Yeah. And so before, December 19th, how would you describe your relationship with Terrell? Was it good? Was it not? We, we, we cousins. We just, it was like, yeah, we was, yeah, we was good, we cousins. I mean, you guys were cousins, you hung out before? Yeah. Okay. And then what happened on December 19th? Yeah. So before December 19th, you were on good terms with Terrell? Correct. And then, uh, do you remember if there was a conversation with Terrell on December 19th that was not so good? We were just arguing about the night. We just argued. I was mad at the fact that I don't know what he did or what had happened. I was just mad at the fact that he got the, that he got the house surrounded. So we arguing about that, and I'm, you know. So that that's yeah, we basically got off got off on bad terms right there. Okay. So without getting into all the details, the underlying details, but on December nineteenth, you had some conversation with Terrell that was not so good, it was not pleasant. Correct. So then on December twenty sixth of twenty twenty two, on the day of the shooting, were you on good terms with Terrell? <clears throat> no. Do you know where Terrell was on December 26th? He was in jail. We was just, we basically, yeah, that's why I said, because the 19th he got locked up and he ain't make bail or nothing, so I can't say we was on good terms because we never really got to talk it out or make up. Okay. But I mean, before December 19th, you and Terrell are pretty good. Yeah, we used to. After December 19th, not so good. Right. <clears throat> um, on 
the day Maya was shot or during the previous week, you know, really focusing on that week in December. You know, did, was there any accusations that you or Maya had snitched on Jarrell? Yeah. You know, I'm going to object to this line of question. I think we need to have a sidebar because I'm not sure exactly where we're going with all this, but. Mr. Kirkhoff, do you want to make an objection or statement for the court? Yes, I'm going to object on the basis of relevance. I'm going to go for a while. But now we're getting so far afield, it's not even funny. Uh, there was absolutely nothing during the investigation regarding this. And to now you know, try to lead this, uh, this witness and to say, OK, yeah, maybe I had a fight with some other guy, it just does not it isn't relevant to what we're here for today. All right. Uh, I'm going to give the prosecutor some latitude uh, on this matter. Uh, I think she's trying to develop a theory, uh, possibly related to motive, and I'll let uh, her do that. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Dean, I believe my question was, you know, focusing on the day that Maya was shot or that previous week, did anyone accuse you or Maya of snitching on Terrell about something? Yeah. Who accused you of that? He, he thought we told him. Did Terrell? Terrell, Terrell, he thought we, we he thought he thought we snitched on him. Nobody snitched. So Terrell thought either you or my snitched on him. Correct. And he told you that himself. Yeah. About the December nineteenth incident. Right. Do you know Keontae Newber? No. Do you know someone that goes by the name T Man? We, we like we're on what time frame? I'm talking now. So as now, you sit there right now. Now, yeah. So that the person that goes by the name Tame Man is that person in the courtroom? Yeah. Where's he at? Can you tell me something he's wearing? Uh, the. But but, um, yeah. Where's he seated at? Next to uh. The old man. Sorry, Mr. Kirkhoff, but <laughs> the record reflect the identification of the defendant. Okay, just so we're, we're talking, was it Tay Man? Tay Man. Tay Man, okay. You know, just so, just you know someone named Tay Man that goes by Tay Man? I, I, not before, I just learned that. But, but you do now? Due to the courts, yeah. Okay. And is Tay Man in the courtroom? Yes. All right, what's he wearing? The ugly button-up shirt. <laughs> and he's sitting next to the old man at the defense table? Yes. He's identified the defendant. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. And so, Mr. Dana, now you know this man over here is came in. Yes. So, how did, how did you meet him, or how do you know the defendant? I don't know him. So, have you met him before? Uh... Possibly, if so, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I met him before. Who did you meet him through? I just seen him around with my uh, with my cousin before. Nothing serious. With Terrell. Yeah. So you've seen the defendant with Terrell before. Yeah, that's it. 
Is that how you met the defendant? Yes. Were you ever on good terms with the defendant? I didn't. We didn't. We didn't t speak. So it's not like you hung out with the defendant. I never hung out with him. You just knew him through trial. I just saw him before. Yes. So on December 26th of 2022, the day that Maya was shot and killed, uh, were you on good terms or bad terms with the defendant? I don't know that man. Never had any problems with him before? I don't know that man. Was there a time that you had a, a not so pleasant interaction with the defendant um, at 47 Canton? I don't know him. I never had no problem with him. What was there a time that you had an interaction with him on campus? Well, this is the last answer, Your Honor. Uh, at, at this point, Ms. Prevett, I think we've established. I think what you need to establish. He's already asked an answer. He says, "I don't know the man. He's not familiar with him. He's never had a conversation with him." So I think you need to move on. Well, Your Honor, I believe I can refresh his memory about that or something. Well, uh, Your Honor, this is sort of said three times he didn't know him before the December 26th. If you have a statement to impeach him with, you can try to impeach him with a statement. Thank you. So, Mr. Dean, I'm just going to show you a portion of a statement that you gave to Detective Sean Wolf. okay? Okay. At this point, I'm just going to ask you to look at it, read it to yourself. Okay. Okay. Really just this paragraph right here. You could read more or less if you want, but at least that paragraph. Okay. Yes. Uh, what about it? I'm sorry? What about it? So did you have a chance to read that? Yes. Uh, do you remember saying that to the detective? I, um, and without getting into all the details of it, just, first of all, do you remember saying that to the detective? I would like to know what she's refreshing memory with. Well, if you could, yeah, let him know, or you can go up there and review it. Why don't you show him, show him what you're talking about here, Mr. Bat? Okay, very good, thank you. So Mr. Dana, did you have a chance to read what I just showed you? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember that conversation with Detective Wolf? I remember something similar to that, yeah. And so without getting into all the details, uh, did you tell detectives that you saw the defendant with Terrell on December 11th? You no, know, I did not. What the statement says. I did not. Can I talk? Uh, just, just not quite yet. I don't know what the statement says. I don't have it. Did you review the statement? Yes. Does it say that you saw the defendant with Terrell on December uh, 12th? No, I said I said I did not see that face. That that face had a, I didn't see who that was. I didn't know who that was because they had a mask on. And you didn't say in here that you thought it was Keontae? No, they asked me did I think it was him because I said I don't know. I just seen the, I, the person had a mask on and they uh. And I could see a tattoo, but I don't. I say I specifically said I'm not finna say that that's him because I'm not for sure. I'm not finna accuse nobody of doing something they didn't do. That's those my words. Sure. And it says that right there too. But you have seen Tayman, the defendant, with Terrell on a number of occasions, correct? On a number of occasions. 
Yes. Not a number of occasions. Okay. More than one? I don't even think it was more than one. I don't even know. <coughs> I, I think it was just once that I saw them together, and it was just a normal day. Mr. Dana, you knew that Terrell and the defendant were close, right? Yeah, they friends. Okay. Well, wait a minute. I'm going to object to that. You know my client, Your Honor, saw him once. How could he say whether my client was close with somebody? I agree. There's no foundation for that. If you want to try to lay a foundation, Ms. Prevett, that's fine. I think we need to move on, though. Go ahead. That was going to be my next question. If he's saying that they're close, I mean, what is he basing that on? Well, it should be the other way around, Your Honor. What do you he mean? didn't know my client. He only saw my client once. He's not in a position to say who's, who my client's friends with. Do, do you know uh, the extent of the relationship between Terrell and this gentleman? Do you know how close they were? I knew, I knew my, I don't know, I just knew my, I knew my cousin was gay and I heard he was gay, so I thought they were sleeping with each other. That's all I knew. I only seen him one time. Okay. You only saw him one time. Yeah. That's it. We're moving on to a different subject, Mr. Bad. Thank you, Your Honor. And so when Detective Wells was speaking with you, Mr. Dana, yeah, you end up talking about, you know, when you're talking about people who may want to harm you or who were mad at you on that day, did you talk about anybody else? Anybody else far as who? That wanted to harm you or that was mad at you on December 26th of 2022. Besides um, Terrell Franklin. Besides Terrell Franklin. I said I don't I don't recall I don't even recall. I don't I don't think I said nobody. You didn't talk about LA? Um we yeah, we had our differences, but we, he didn't I didn't I told him I didn't think he I don't I don't I don't remember. I don't remember I was kinda intoxicated that day. Do you know Marquise Welch? Uh, I think he goes by the street name or nickname Black. Black? Yes. No, I never heard of Black, but uh Yeah, I seen Marquise Welch around before. seeing them around like like you just like uh it's like you just see you just see people i just seen them around people. i can't really tell you like like i'm not saying we friends or i i've hung with them i just seen them around and so on december 26th of 2022 were you on good terms or bad terms with him how would you describe that no terms it wasn't no it was no just no terms yeah When you said you see Marquise around, have you ever seen Marquise Welch around with the defendant? No. You've never seen them together? No. So based on your you know, personal knowledge of everything that was going on on December 26th of 2022, uh, based on what you know, was Maya the intended target of the shooting? I'm gonna object, Your Honor. I just think that is gross speculation. Sustained. Okay, Mr. Kirkhoff may have some questions for you, sir, oh. okay? Mr. Kirkhoff, do you have some questions for this witness? Yes, sure. Did you or Maya snitch on Terrell? No. And after Terrell got arrested, you spoke to him at the jail a number of times, didn't you? Yes. And you found out that it wasn't, or he found out it wasn't you or Mike, correct? Through these uh, conversations that you didn't snitch on, right? I told him I didn't tell him. Okay. So there was no reason for him to be mad at you, was there? He was still mad. Yeah, but he knew that you were the snitch, right? Objection, asked an answer. Go ahead and answer the question, sir. 
he was still mad. And you did talk to him a number of times when he was in jail, correct? I ain't known a number of times. We spoke once. We spoke once. Just once? Yes. <clears throat> and before December 26th, you had no idea who this individual was, did you? Before December 26th? Yep. You only learned his name and his nickname afterwards, right? After the shooting. I, I, I saw him around before. Yeah, but you didn't know who he was, did you? By name? Yeah. No. Okay, going back to December 26th, <clears throat> well, you remember testifying earlier in this same manner, correct? Yeah, wait, wait, what you mean? And when the, there was a knock at the door, you were going to go to the door, but Maya told you not to. Remember that? Yes. And why did she tell you not to? Because uh, I was out on bond and wasn't supposed to be over there. She thought it might be the police, and therefore you shouldn't be answering the door, right? Yep. And you're not supposed to be there, correct? Yep. And despite that, you were there almost every night, Mancha. Yep. <clears throat> now, you don't remember telling the initial officer that uh, she opened the door? I never said she opened the door. So that officer's wrong? No, you, you, I don't even think an officer said that. That was never, never. All right, but you do remember telling the police that it was a weird voice, right? Correct. Sounded like a white guy, right? I don't remember. I don't never. I don't think I said that. that. I don't recall saying that. I don't. You recall remember saying telling him that, or is he wrong? I said it was a real voice. And you don't remember following that up with saying it was a white guy, sounded like a white guy. I said it was a weird voice. I did not recognize the voice. You heard the officer test, or no? I'm sorry, you didn't. You weren't here. Correct. Um. Okay. The police officer said that he said it was a weird voice and sounded like a white male. That's wrong. If, I don't know what the police officer would say, but I know what I said. You did not say anything about a white male? Sounded like it, a white male? I said, I get asked that question so many times that the, the answer keeps slightly changing because I keep saying it's a weird voice and y'all keep trying to ask me ways to make your voice sound like something. I don't know what the voice was. I did not recognize the voice. So if you ask me again, you're probably going to get a different answer because I don't recognize the voice. I'm trying to get you to understand that. I'm for the Anything else for this witness uh, from the prosecution? I got just one moment here. Sure. Yeah, right. Sure. Nothing additional. Thank you. Uh, can this witness be excused? I think he wants to be. No objection. <laughs> Any objection? No objection. You're excused, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, next witness, please. Can I have a moment to see who's out in the hallway? Sure. Hi, um, right over here, sir. <coughs> Can you please raise your right hand? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth stuff you got? Yes. Very good. Have a seat, please. Go ahead, Mr. Faber. Good afternoon, sir. Could you state and spell your first and last names, please? Jasper Keys, K E Y S. Jasper, common spelling? Yes, J A S P E R. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Jerry Baber. I'm with the prosecutor's office. I just have a, a few questions for you. Okay. Um, direct your attention back to December 26th of 2022. Where were you living at uh, back in, on that date? Uh, 39 Canton. 
and shown him on the board here exhibit 24? No. Do, do you reckon? I live at 39. Okay, so on on this, can you see that image? Yeah. Do you see Canton Street, the, the gray horizontal line there? I'll zoom in a little bit. Kind of hard to see at this point, sir. Yeah, I can see. Do you see 39 Canton Street, uh, that address? It's not on there. Yeah, it is right there, next to 35. Okay, yes, sir. So that, that would be where you were living back on December 26th? Yeah. 2022? Yeah. Were you home in the uh, the evening hours on that day, the day after Christmas? Yeah, but we were asleep. Did something wake you up? No. Uh, when I woke up, uh, somebody knocked on the door, and I got dogs. Okay, do you remember speaking to police back then? Yeah, but I was half asleep at the time, and I was uh, trying to get my dogs because they was always fighting, so I was trying to keep them from fighting each other at the time, too, so it was a lot going on at the time. Okay, uh, do you remember speaking to police? Yeah. Do you remember police asking you if you heard or saw anything related to a shooting? No. You don't recall it? Sure. Hi, Mr. Keith. If you could, to yourself, don't read it out loud. Mm -hmm. Read this paragraph right here below 39 Canton Jasper Keys. Mm -hmm. Right, because I had the TV on and everything, and then in my neighborhood, there's so much going on, so you know, that wouldn't have phased me anyway, because it's just everything, that neighborhood is like that, so, you know what I mean, It was that could have been anything. I don't, you know, so the, so that's... The, the, what thing could have been anything? It could have been my TV was on too, I mean, it was a lot going on. Okay, so what did you tell the, what did you I told them that I could have heard shots or anything, I didn't tell them I knew. Because I didn't, because that would have been wrong, because it was a TV on and everything, and I was asleep. So, I mean, that would have been lying. So, you know what I mean? That's, I couldn't have said nothing like that. And like I said, that neighborhood is like that, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, let me ask you this. At, back on December 26th, when you spoke to the, the police officer, mm -hmm. whether it was shots or, or other noise, what time did you hear that noise? I don't know. Do you, remember, do you remember giving the police a time? No, because I was asleep and I woke up. And so I can't really say, you know what I mean? I was, like I said, I was in, the, it was just, I don't remember all of that. And that was what? Right, so let me, let me ask you this. A while ago. Did you tell the police that you heard four or five shots at 9.50 p.m.? I told them I thought I heard. Okay, fair enough. You know, I didn't say it because I didn't know for sure. So, did you did you tell the police that you thought you heard four? I thought. And then you had woken up and you looked at your clock and it was 9.50. I 
I don't remember all of that. I seen that, but I don't remember. I can't state that I said. Because like I said, I woke up at the time. I can't. And that was a while ago. So I can't really. I can't really go with that. Because I wouldn't. You know, that was. So was your memory better back uh, on on December 26th? I wouldn't. I wouldn't know that. Because like I said, I was sleep. Anybody that wakes up sleep. And with all that going on. Anything. You can say. You know, I mean, I can't really. And like I said, and it's on it, and I wasn't definite about that too. You know what I mean? Because I wasn't. You know what I mean? Because I couldn't just sit up. Because my neighborhood, like I said, is like that. So and my TV was on, and so anything could have happened. You know what I mean? So and then when he knocked on the door, and then those like that, that could have been the same thing. Okay. You know what I mean? So I'm not really sure. And then when you knock on my door, that noise is the same thing. Mr. Yeah. I understand what you're saying right now as you, as you look back, but I'm asking mm -hmm. you today, when you spoke to police, you remember that? Yeah. Do you remember telling the police that you woke up to the loud sound of gunshots? I wasn't sure what that was, like I stated on the paper. And you remember looking at your clock and seeing that it was 9.50, and telling me, at least telling the officer, that what possibly could have been gunshots was at 9.50? I was woke, I still can't, because I'm not yeah. sure about that, because I woke up sleep, half sleep, man, I can't, no. If I had been woke, it would have been, been different, but I was half asleep. That's, mm -mm. Yeah. I can't. Yeah, Mr. No, Mr. Keys, mm -hmm. uh, did, you, did you ever look outside that night? After he um, came to the door, I looked out and seen all the police and all that. Other than that, because mm -mm, like if you hear that noise, you is not ain't no way I'm gonna stick my head out there. Did you see you know, or hear anything related to a shooting, other than what you testified to already? Did you see? No. Okay. Nothing further. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kirkoff. Yeah, Mr. Keys, you said the neighborhood is like that. Like what? It's, you know, it ha things happen. Are you saying there's occasional shots in your neighborhood? All the time. Anything else for this witness, Mr. Faber? No, thank you. Uh, Mr. Keyes, you're excused. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Appreciate you coming in. <clears throat> Next witness, please. Officer James Smith. Good afternoon, sir. Come on over. I'll swear you in right before you sit down, okay? Please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth stuff you got? Absolutely. Very good. Have a seat, please. Well, I, these microphones pick up everything, okay? You talk about them. Basically, the prosecution is trying to present this in a linear fashion so it all makes sense, but this witness to be accommodated for a schedule is here kind of out of order. That's why what you're trying to tell them, right, Mr. Faber? That's absolutely correct. And I have no problem with that. 
All right, very good. I already swore him in, so I think you're ready to go. Sir, could you state and spell your first and last name? It's James Smith, J-A-M-E-S-S-M-I-T-H. You're in uniform, but can you tell us during your application, please? I work for the Grand Rapids Police Department. I'm assigned to the special response team. Uh, a brief summary of what the special response team does. Uh, we kind of handle anything the chief asks us to do. That's the easiest way to put it. Any kind of issues that need to be addressed, we handle it. And is, is like the tactical team part of the, the special response team? Absolutely, yep. Like what would be on a TV called SWAT? Yes, yeah. Okay. It's not a disclaimer, is that or no? <sighs> Depends on the day. Okay. Going back to December 27th of last year, 2022, do you have a good memory of that? Of yes, that sir. Day? Your memory is good? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's refreshing. Um, in the evening of December 27th, did you have occasion to perform a traffic stop on a 2013 Silver Dodge Journey? Yes. Can you describe um, where that occurred, please? It was on Cherry, just west of Madison, is where we initiated the traffic stop. Cherry, uh, west of Madison. Uh, where is that in relation to, say, Division and, and Hall? Uh, it'd be north of Hall, and it's east of Division. If you're downtown, it's just to the southeast of the center downtown area. So maybe uh, maybe a mile or two north of, of Hall? Yeah, that's approximately. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, was the, what was the reason for the traffic stop? Uh, the vehicle had a cracked windshield across the front of the windshield. Okay, so a, uh, an equipment violation? Yes, sir. Describe the traffic stop, if you would, for the jury. Uh, we activated our overhead siren or our overhead lights first. The vehicle slowed but did not stop. Um, it continued uh, a few uh, city blocks there and was not stopping. We activated our sirens. The vehicle still didn't stop. And then when it finally came to a stop, uh, we addressed it in a high risk fashion. Why is that? Whenever a vehicle doesn't pull over right away, um, it's consistent with people either trying to run or uh, hide certain items or something like we, we don't know exactly what's going on but it's not normal if that would be a case so and so how long from the first the moment your lights were first activated and this slowed to stop over how long a period of time and over how big of a distance did, it, uh, did that occur i would have to ask i don't know i'd estimate several seconds about an extended period of time and you said the high risk stop uh, describe that please uh, so when we have our firearms out and we're addressing the occupants in the vehicle, uh, we call them back to us instead of just approaching the vehicle. So in addition to the driver, was there anybody else in this vehicle? It was just the driver. And who was the driver? Marquise Welch. Um, describe your interaction with Mr. Welch. Uh, he advised that the driver door had damage, so he had to exit out the passenger side. Um, he walked back to us. Uh, he was detained in handcuffs. Um, after the vehicle was confirmed clear, a uh, full search of this person was conducted. He had no driver's license. Um, you want me to continue? And so no driver's license, that's an arrestable offense? Yes, sir. So he was searched. Um, did, you, did you do the search or did you witness the search? Officer Tyler, Sir, or Tyler Smith uh, conducted the search and I was standing right there with him as a cover officer. Okay. Any, uh, were there any weapons found on Mr. Welch? No weapons. Uh, what about uh, phones, cell phones? There was a cell phone, um, some money in the under $400, I believe, and then um, there was some suspected narcotics that later tested. On his person? On his person. Okay. And um, was that, that cell phone was uh, placed into evidence? Yes. Did you observe the damage to the door that prevented the, the, the driver's door from opening? Uh, no, I don't remember looking at the driver's door. We just took his word for it that it was damaged and wouldn't open. Do you recall the, uh, the license plate number of the vehicle that uh, uh, that you stopped that Mr. Welch was driving? I don't have it memorized, what but it was listed in my report. Would you look at the, uh, would look at the report and pressure memory? Absolutely. And the record reflects on defense counsel a uh, copy of um, Officer Smith's police report. Yes. If you could just read it to yourself, uh, 
the first beginning of the first paragraph there. Yep, the license plate, Michigan Registration, Edward King Paul, 9524. Parked in the roadway, blocking traffic. The registered owner was not on scene, it was towed. And is there an inventory policy when you take custody of a, of a vehicle? Yes, sir. Was a vehicle, an inventory search done of that vehicle? Yes. Um, did you find, did you, did you participate in the search of the vehicle? Yes, sir. Did you find any firearms? No firearms. Any, sh any ammunition? I did not find any. No. Any ammunition components such as shell casings? Not that I found. Uh, anything of evidentiary value? There's two uh, tablets located in the vehicle. One was on the third row driver side, and the other one was in the uh, front passenger floorboard. By tablet, you don't know, mean pills. Do you mean uh, electronic? Yeah, I apologize. Yep, an electronic tablet. Okay. You mentioned narcotics. Were there any narcotics found in the vehicle? Uh, just on Marquise's person. Any questions for uh, Officer Smith, Mr. Turco? Yes, you said you thought you found what you thought was you thought was drugs. Did they test positive? They did. For what? Uh, fentanyl. Was he also arrested on that then? Yes, sir. All right. And when you pull up, you when you find out who he is, you also run his name for the lead, correct? That's correct. And he had a couple of uh, conditional release orders, bond conditional release orders. Objection so, relevance. Mr. Mr. Kirkhoff, what's the relevance of this? Um, well, I want to know what he was arrested on, right? Uh, I think that's valid. <laughs> if you... <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, he had two conditional release uh, violations. One was for narcotics, and the other one uh, I don't 100% recall, but I know one was for narcotics. That's what he did report. Will that refresh your memory? Absolutely. It was detailed in there. Oh, yep. What was the other one for? Felon in possession of a firearm. And was he raised, uh, was, excuse me, was he also arrested on these, for violating these bond releases? It's a conditional release violation, yes, sir. Okay. I have nothing to agree on. Anything else for this witness? So he, uh, in addition to the drugs that were found in his person, uh, he was arrested on violations of bond for drugs and guns. Yes, sir. Nothing further. Anything else, Mr. Kirkhoff? No, you're right. All right. Thank you, Officer Thank you, Smith. Yes. You are excused. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Next witness, please. We will call Roberto Augustin. Okay. And do we need an interpreter for this one? Okay. We and we have one, I assume. I, that was my. <laughs> that was the reason for the hesitation. Okay. The rep reflect we have Donna Boss as our interpreter this afternoon. Uh, do we have two chairs up there? OK. 
Okay, before we begin, I need to swear in, first of all, Ms. Boss as an interpreter. Ms. Boss, could you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will truly, accurately, and impartially interpret the matter now before the court and not divulge confidential communications? So, if you got. I do. Very good. Thank you. And at this point, I will swear in the witness. Sir, could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. All right, very good. Be seated, please. Go ahead when you're ready, Mr. Faber. Good afternoon, sir. Could you state and spell your first and last name? Usted puede decir y deletrear su nombre, su apellido, por favor. Roberto Agustín. Roberto Agustín. Es R O B It's R O B R T O T O T A U G U A S A U G U S T I N T I N And back on December 26th of 2022 entonces él decía el 26 de diciembre de 2022 donde vivía. En la 23 Canton. At 23 Canton. Southwest Grand Rapids. Southwest Grand Rapids. Michigan. Were you home on the evening of December 26? ¿Usted estaba a casa en la noche del 26 de diciembre? Sí, yes. Sí, estaba en la casa. Yes, I was at home. Did you have some contact with police? ¿Usted tuvo algo de contacto con la policía? Uh, Tuvo contacto con ellos cuando entraron en la casa a chequear la cámara. I had contact with them when they came into the house to check the cameras. Okay. Does your house have an ex, uh, a, a camera on the outside of your home? ¿La casa suya tiene una cámara en la parte exterior de la casa suya? Sí. Yes. And where is it located on the front of your home? ¿Y dónde está ubicada en la parte de enfrente de su casa? Enfrente está arriba de, de la casa. Uh, en frente. Mejor arriba. It's up. Up. On the house? On the third, on the second floor? In the second floor? Yes, on the second floor. And what does the camera point at? 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 23 Canton is what you, was your testimony? Y la 23 Canton, eso fue su testimonio. Sí. Yes. Can, on exhibit 24 here, can you, can you see the numbers on the houses? En la prueba número 24, ¿te puede ver los números en las casas? No. <laughs> no. I can't see them. I'm like 50 no, feet closer, Mr. Yo no Faber, puedo so. verlos y tengo de cerca más 50 pies. <laughs> Y que tengo que ver en esos números de casa. And what does the house numbers have to do with it? You see the number 23. Usted mira el número 23. La 23 es la cantona y está allí. Ahí está la 23. Yeah, the 23 is there. So on the north side of Canton Street. En la parte del norte de la calle Canton. Yes. So the camera points directly in front of your house. La cámara está apuntada directamente en frente de su casa. Yeah, in front of the house. It takes in everything. Do you, you remember the police coming to you to uh, to see if they could obtain video evidence? Usted recuerda que la policía venía a usted para ver si podían obtener las pruebas video. Sí. Yes. Did you cooperate with them and provide video evidence? Usted cooperó con ellos y le dio las pruebas de video. Yes, yes. Did you? Prior to contact with police. Antes del contacto con la policía. On the evening of December 26. En la noche del 26 de diciembre. 2022. 2022. Did you hear or see anything related to a shooting? Usted escuchó o vio algo relacionado. Yo no vi nada. Yo andaba durmiendo. I didn't see anything. I was sleeping. Yo nunca no escuché nada. I never heard anything. I just gave the authorization for the police to check the cameras. And the 
the time stamp on your camera. Y el el la hora y fecha que están en la cámara. Was it accurate? Eh, fue correcto. Ah, uh, es que las cámaras que tengo no está bien las horas. The cameras está. that I have, the hours aren't quite right on them. Okay, another an officer that you had contact with said that they were a little bit over five hours off. Un, po, un, un oficial de policía con quien tu, 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 tuvo contacto dijo de que la, fe, la hora en las cámaras era como de cinco horas equivocadas. Sí, es, 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 yeah. está, las horas como un ejemplo está grabando, no sé, no le puedo activar bien. The, I can't, the, bueno, the hours that it's showing when it's activated, I can't arrange them or fix them very well. You didn't see or hear anything ¿Y usted no vio? No escuchó nada no. relacionado al... No, yo no. no. Y las cámaras a la policía que checaba todo. Y lo único es eso. And the cameras that the police checked, that's all there was. Okay, and you gave them everything. Usted les dio todo. Sí, todo que checaba. Yes, everything that they checked, everything. Thank you for your time. Gracias por su tiempo. Any questions for this witness? All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Augustin. I appreciate your testimony. And thank you, Ms. Boss, for interpreting here for us today. You are both excused. It's all? Si. Okay. Next witness, please. People call Detective Derek Hall. Also out of order, Your Honor, for uh, ex expedited time. Is that sure, that sounds good. And I think we'll take a break after uh, this witness, okay? Good afternoon, sir. Please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Stuff you got. Yes, sir. Very good. Have a seat, please. Go ahead, Mr. Faber. Thank you. Sir, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you state and spell your first and last names, please? Uh, my name is Derek Hall, uh, D E R E K H A L R. And what is your occupation, sir? I am a detective at the Grand Rapids Police Department. How long have you been a police officer? Um, I've been with um, the city of Grand Rapids a little over seven years. Any, any law enforcement experience prior to that? No, sir. And how long have you been a detective? Um, almost three years. So a fairly quick rise to the detective bureau. Uh, yes, sir. I'm humbled. Humility is good. Did you become involved in a homicide that occurred? on December 26, 2022 at 47 Canyon Street. I did. Uh, I was called in that evening to the scene uh, along with Detective Wolf and Detective Bayless. Uh, Detective Wolf seated here in the, in the courtroom? Yes, sir. And Detective Bayless? Yes, sir. Who was, was there a lead detective? Like, how, how does it work with the Detective Bureau? Was there one lead assigned with assistance? At the time I was in the general case unit, Detective Wolf and Detective Bayless are um, in the major case team, um, I was brought in just to assist, but Detective Wolf is the primary investigator on the incident. You said you arrived there that evening, about what time, if you, if you know approximately what time you might have arrived? I believe it was just after midnight. And what was your role uh, upon your arrival there? Um, <clears throat> my job essentially was to stay with Detective Wolf and assist him with whatever he needed. Uh, when we arrived there, there was um, it was quite cold, it was dark outside, so it took us a while to do a walkthrough of the scene. Um, <clears throat> our crime scene techs were called, they were there processing when we got there. Uh, we briefly looked in the home, uh, just poked our heads in essentially, and then some of the um, family members arrived. Um, <clears throat> We assisted with dealing with them and then also with a uh, canvas of the area, which includes, you know, talking to witnesses, looking for cameras, that, that type of stuff. In relation to cameras, did you become 
involved in the collection of, of uh, potential video evidence? Some, but that, um, that was after the fact. We have a detective that's specifically assigned to uh, gather um, and maintain video evidence. He was also called in that evening. Uh, once uh, a piece of video evidence was identified, it was actually him that did the collection, but I was involved later in analyzing uh, several pieces of, of video. All right, so that's what I'd like to talk with, uh, with you about first right now. Um, when you're analyzing a, a, a video, in, in this case, was there something specifically at the onset of the investigation that you were looking for? There was. Um, <clears throat> several of the homes on Canton uh, had home surveillance systems. Uh, the only one that, that we found from a residence was at 23 Canton, which is, uh, I believe, five homes east of where the incident took place. Um, they had a camera that was up towards their second story facing south, um, and it was a home that was on the north side of the road, so it, the, the main camera captured both the sidewalks uh, of, of Canton, essentially. Um, that was gathered by Detective Porter that evening. Okay, and you, but you personally analyzed that, uh, that video from 23 Canton? I did, the, fo the following day, yes. One moment, I'll move for the admission of Exhibit 22, the video obtained from 23 Canton. Any objection? No, Your Honor. 22 is admitted. And before I go to... Oh, sorry. You see 23... Uh, your eyesight, you're young. Do you see 23 Canton? I do. Here? I think you're correct about the, uh, the number of 20, 23 is five houses down from where 47 Canton is. That's correct. 47 and 43 are the same. Uh, 47 is not notated on there, but it's a duplex. So the, the west side of that building that says 43 is the address 47. Before I start uh, to play the video, um, you said that the camera was on the front second story of 23 Canton? Yeah, it was, uh, it was elevated um, <clears throat> and kind of looked down facing to the south. To the south, okay. Yes. And you have permission to publish? Granted. 22. 22. And if you could pause it. The date and the time stamp. Uh, were there efforts made to uh, to compare it with actual time, to compare the posted time with actual time? Yes, yeah, so it was immediately apparent on scene that the time was off. Uh, that was noted, um, I believe, by the resident to Detective Porter upon collection, but then that time was verified um, via our police arrival. We have an in-car video system that links to Axon, and it's... Um, it has the real time stamp on there. Um, eventually in this video you can see when those officers respond and that so the time can be verified. But I believe that the time stamp on there is five hours and 14 minutes fast. Okay, so we're gonna have some math involved here. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> so, So this is a vehicle that was identified in a silver Dodge Journey. Um, 
in this video segment that is the first time that it drives by you'll see approximately three minutes later it drives by again you can tell it's the same video because it, or the same vehicle it has very distinct damage on the driver's side door um, it's hard to see in that specific frame but and that's at uh, the time stamp three three o'clock and six seconds or 18 seconds into the Playing the video. Right. Which let's, let's back this up just a minute. Maybe let's start at the end. <clears throat> we'll pause it when the vehicle you, you mentioned first appears. Stop it there. And then I think with E we can so stopping it at uh, timestamp three o'clock and three seconds. If you know, tell us to pause if you notice the uh, damage we're referring to. So. <coughs> You can see on the driver's side door um, <clears throat> and along that front left wheel, uh, that front left fender, there is uh, pretty extensive damage. It was especially viewable when it's pre um, pretty much in line with that pickup truck that's that's parked right there. Okay. And now, um, pause it there at three o'clock and six seconds. You said five hours and 14 minutes fast? I believe so, yes. So that would be 9.46 p.m.? That's correct. Okay. On the 26th. <coughs> you testified that uh, about three minutes later the vehicle reappeared? That's correct. Street. It is. So not uncommon to see residents coming and going. No, it's very common. This uh, the entire Burton Heights area is pretty much residential, uh, except for the intersection of basically Burton and Division. All the streets off of Division on both sides are are all homes. <coughs> So you'll see here again in a second that uh, that same silver Dodge Journey drives by again. It is, and it was, uh, I think there's a frame or two back where it's caught in the light, and you can see it much better, too. <clears throat> What's the next thing of a entry value that you find? 
So a, sh a short time later, um, you're going to see a lone individual running on the north sidewalk eastbound. Um, <clears throat> although dark, you can tell that he has a fairly distinct jacket on that's two-tone. Um, the top half is a different color than the, than the bottom half. This is five houses down from 47 Canton. That's correct. That'd be about half a block. Yes. did, yes. <clears throat> so he's on that sidewalk closest to the to the camera. So that's on the north sidewalk running toward division. Correct. Running to the east. So there he is, just coming into frame. It's harder to see when, when it's stopped on each frame, but when you play it, you can see that his coat is uh, two-tone, lighter on the bottom, darker on the top. Three,
and that, that lone runner heading east was at 9.50 and, and 20 seconds, or 15 seconds. That was all accurate, yes. With those uh, those vehicles heading to the east, did you, uh, did you investigate any surveillance cameras further east from 23 Cambridge? Um, <clears throat> So I was, I'm familiar with the individual that works for the Rapid that has access to cameras at, at the bus stops, whichever ones do have them. There is a bus stop at the northwest corner of Canton Division, which Division is the next avenue to the east. Um, <clears throat> I obtained that video the next, the next day. Um, it wasn't as useful. It didn't really show much. Um, due to this being north of Canton, we deduced that the person didn't run to the north then because they would have gone by the cameras. Um, there was also a video that was obtained from the business at the southwest corner. It's um, an automotive shop called Luna. Again, that was Detective Porter that handled obtaining that video, um, but I assisted with analyzing it. Bus stop, or what was the, the camera view of the bus stop video? What was that? What was it pointed at? So the cameras at the bus stops are up in the awnings and they generally face down. So they'll capture if a bus pulls up and somebody gets off, but that's that's generally it. That and then a small portion of the sidewalk. Um, there was a person that gets off of a bus a, a few minutes before this incident. Um, he's in a like a construction bust and you can see them on the camera, but um, it's very brief. All right, well, the people move for the admission of the kids 25 and 26 to video clips from Luna, uh, Luna Auto. Oh, okay. Thank you, 25 and 26 are admitted. So this is the video from Luna, the automotive shop. It's the southwest corner of Canton and Division. You can see, I know there's a lot of snow, but you can see where the, the vehicles with the, with the backup lights on. That's actually the Silver Dodge Journey with the distinct damage. But right now it's essentially in the middle of Canton. The avenue you can see with the divider is Division. So this camera is facing north, north, northeast. Essentially. You could uh, show the jury division. So this is um, division that runs along here. The camera's kind of at, it's almost like tilted too, um, so it's a little distorted. But this is division and then this is Canton. So division runs north and south. Canton runs to the west off of the division. For the record, you had uh, on exhibit uh, 25, you described the division as the, the, the snow covered road that runs uh, from the middle right of the screen to the top center uh, on a diagonal, and then Canton Street was the, the horizontal road near the top of the screen. That's correct. What, how you said, this is the, this was the suspect's vehicle, the, the one that, that had your interest? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so, two, oh, before I get into that, two questions regarding the, uh, the camera system. Is this constantly recording or is it a uh, motion sensor? So, uh, Detective Porter, um, again, he's the detective that handles the video. When he obtained the video, it was fairly segmented, and the reasoning for that is that um, it's a motion camera system. So, there are spots where it is off. Um, <clears throat> for instance, this clip 
is immediately following the last time we saw the Dodge Journey drive by and luckily it picked up the motion and activated. But before this, there, there's I think a three or four minute gap before the, the most previous video. So this is picking up right after the, the video from um, 23 Canton, the last time that that silver Dodge Journey pulls through. So it came from over here and then pulled to right here. And we verified that uh, again with, with the timestamp. Uh, the timestamp on this video was, was within a few seconds, I remember, but I don't think it's visible. Okay, so to compare that with your testimony from the 23 Canton address, the second time the vehicle drove by on that camera system was 949.05? That's correct. Yes. And you said this is an accurate, uh, a fairly accurate, with it, well within a minute? Uh, definitely within a minute, yeah. And this is, and it's hard to see at the top, of 12, 26, 22, uh, 9, 49. Yeah, yeah, I think it says 50 seconds, maybe. Okay, so uh, in the same minute as when it passed by 23 Canton uh, the second time. That is correct. We can, we can start to hit uh, play, exhibit 25. So again, you can see that uh, briefly before it was out of view, but it does have the, the damage to the driver's side door is still visible. Pause it there. So at 9.50 and 22 seconds, did the headlights go off? Yes. So you can see after he pulls in and comes to a stop, the headlights on the on the vehicle turn off. But the brake lights are still on. Keep just keep playing this through to completion. So if, if everyone noticed there, the, the individual that was observed running um, eastbound down Canton on the north sidewalk is again visible um, running to that Silver Dodge Journey and then entering the, the passenger side door in the front. So. So starting at 9.50.32, so again he'll be visible here at the very end of this clip with the distinct white on the bottom, dark on the top. That's 9.50.43. He enters the front passenger. 
It's been admitted. There is again. That's because of the the way that it uh, saves on the D, the DVR from it being motion activated. That's the very next clip in the sequence, and there's some overlap there at the end of the previous one and the beginning of this one. But at the same time, uh, reflected 950.44, as the as the person is rounding the uh, the front right uh, corner of the car. That's correct. I believe there was some slight damage, yes, on the on the front passenger door. Again, um, there is, uh, it's actually visible right there. Uh, there's a crease on that uh, passenger door. Okay, and, you, and when you said right there, you're indicating the, uh, basically on the front passenger door of the Dodge turn. That's correct. So they turned from eastbound Canton to southbound division there. Again, no headlights activated. Any cameras that you analyzed uh, <coughs> south of division in Canton? I did. Uh, Detective Porter also got video from the gas station. That is at the northwest corner of division of Hall. Hall is the next street south of Canton. Um, so it's essentially behind that camera that we just watched. Did you have a chance to analyze that video? I did, yes. All right, move for the admission to the 27, the Sunoco gas station video. No objection. Thank you, 27 admitted. So we have sound on this one. We do. Was there, uh, I don't know if I asked you this, but any sound on the 23 Canton? No. Any sound on the uh, Luna Auto video? No, sir. Okay. So can you orient the jury? Uh, what, what's the camera? So I, I believe this is essentially, um, it's on the south of the building. It's somewhere near the front door, but again, it's kind of at a weird angle but it's facing south. This is gonna be Hall Street right here. And then you can see this avenue right here is division. So a short view of uh, the street that runs uh, diagonally in the bottom left corner with the McDonald's sign, that's division? Correct. And then the less steep horizontal line that runs through the center with the gas station pump uh, in front of it, that's Hall Street? Correct. Where's Hall? Hall runs east and west? Correct. And where is Hall in relation to Canton? 
So again, Hall is the next uh, street south of, of Canton, both run east and west. During your analysis of this video, did you see the same vehicle that you observed at, at, uh, on Canton and at the Luna, uh, Luna Auto? I did. So the first time that the <coughs> Silver Dodge journey is, is viewable um, from, the, from the video of 23 Canton, um, it makes the block and then comes around and can be seen the first time going uh, then west on Hall Street. The next avenue to the west of here is Buchanan, so it can be deduced that they went uh, over to, or I'm sorry, Ionia Avenue would be the next west. So west on Hall Street, north on uh, Ionia, and then east again on Canton. It can be seen uh, making that rotation. And in terms of relationship to real time, how accurate is this? Uh, I, I believe it was fairly accurate, or at least within a few minutes. Right, the report indicated within one minute of real time that the. That's correct, yes. Again, you can see that down on the, this is facing the, the passenger side, so that, that distinct crease on the passenger side door um, easily tells us that's that same Silver Dodge journey. This would be the, the um, just after the first time that we saw it on the 23 Canton video. So, you, and that's at 947.02 that we call us that. Does. And are the headlights on at this point? They are. Just prior to um, 
seeing, well, you'll see <clears throat> the vehicle after it leaves the loon a lot, goes south on division and then takes a westbound turn uh, on Hall Street um, and it's visibly trying to get out of the area, no headlights on, um, speeding away. Just prior to that, you can see of several gunshots. So the, the first image uh, of the Dodge Journey was at 9.47 with headlights on. And fast forward three minutes to 9.50. So when comparing to the other, other cameras at this time, the Journey would be backing into the, to the lot of the automotive place at uh, Camden Division. And just to play from, from there. <laughs> That's, that's correct, there's, um, I'm sure everybody could hear it, but there is several shots in quick su succession. Um, sounds, sounds about four or five gunshots. <coughs> Shots at this time, the individual would be running eastbound on the on the north sidewalk of, of Canton towards that park Dodge Journey. And then do you see in, in your review of this, do you see that same vehicle again? You do, yes. All right, so with the with the gunshot sounds that you've described at 950 and 10 seconds, we're starting this at 950 15. I'm just gonna play this until you see that vehicle again.
So again, easily identifiable by the damage. Um, <clears throat> you can see that it's now going westbound uh, on Hall, still no headlights on. This is a 95126 where it's passing Headlights are off at this at this point. At this point, um, the, this would, would have been the day after um, the incident. Um, <clears throat> Detective Wolf, Bayless, and I had all received this video footage and were independently analyzing it. Uh, after seeing that distinct damage on that Dodge Journey, um, <clears throat> what I did was I went back through our records. Um, we can we have the ability to search contacts with vehicles by like make and, and color and those types of things. So I, I put every contact we had with the Silver Dodge Journey in chronological order and went from most recent back. Um, and then whenever we had contact with one, I would watch if there was body camera footage associated or if there say it was there was pictures taken because it was involved in an incident. Um, those types of things. Um, it didn't take me long actually. Uh, I found one from the summer before this. So I think it was in either June or July. Um, we had a contact with a Silver Dodge Journey um, in, it immediately stuck out to me because the, the person listed as the driver is named Marquise Welch in that contact. So he was associated with this, this Dodge Journey and I was familiar with Mr. Welch from, from previous incidents. Um, I think I believe there was a, a citation issued in that incident, so the body camera footage was saved. Um, it was at a bank in the middle of the day, a uh, well-lit area, so I was able to watch that officer's body camera footage when he approaches the Silver Dodge Journey, and I immediately could tell that it was the same one. Um, he walks up on the, on the driver's side, and it's that same damage pattern um, that's on on the Silver Dodge Journey in this video. Um, in that contact, he also states that he can't open the driver's side door because of how he was hit and was damaged, um, which is important to know. Did, were you aware that uh, Mr. Welch was arrested uh, on December 27th? I was, yes. Uh, and that vehicle that uh, he was driving was impounded? It was. Have you, had, have you personally seen that vehicle in police custody? I don't believe I have, no. Okay. Right. Um, so now we have a, a name that is potentially associated with the vehicle. What steps did you do in relation to the next part of your investigation? Um, so on the, on the 27th, I believe our um, Marquise was arrested, Mr. Welch was arrested driving that vehicle. So he was lodged at the, um, at Kent County and then the vehicle is impounded. Uh, obviously it's a, it's a vehicle of interest because we can uh, relate it to this video footage. It was at the scene of a homicide um, just prior and then fleeing afterwards. Um, so uh, search warrants were conducted to search that vehicle and process it for evidence. Um, and also at the time of Mr. Welch's arrest, he had a cell phone with them, which are very useful for, because they, they store a lot of data, could, um, whether it's conversations, text messages, phone calls, location data, those types of things. Um, Mr. Welch's phone was taken from him at that time and uh, a search warrant was obtained and it was downloaded. Um, and just like with the video evidence, I analyzed the, uh, the data from his phone. So directing your attention to your review of data, would that include text messages? Yes. 
Did you look for text messages between Mr. Welch from your analysis of his phone with anybody else on the date of the homicide, December 26th? I did. So there's a function in, a, in that program to just put everything into a timeline. Um, and basically I looked at from the start of the day, Mr. Welch's day on the 26th, um, and then as, as, you know, as it got closer to the incident, um, <clears throat> trying to see who he was communicating with, who he was possibly with. Um, and I found at approximately 4.30 p.m., somewhere around there, he's having a text conversation with somebody listed on his phone as Tayman, um, T-A-E-M-A-N. Um, I'm not sure of the specific phone number, but the, in that conversation, um, they agree to meet up, and, and the, the basis of that is Mr. Welch is gonna pick up this, this Tay man. Uh, the conversation, Tay man says that he's at the Big Top, which I know is, is the um, convenience store at um, 36 in Clyde Park. Uh, it's called the Big Top. So um, he agrees around 4.30 to, to pick him up. I think Tay man says he's cashing out you know, I'll be out in a second. So um, <clears throat> with that, I was interested in who this Tay man was and who Mr. Walsh was picking up. Um, so I, I went to that grocery store and um, with the assistance of, of management, reviewed footage from the day of the 26th around 4.30 when that conversation takes place. And did you I'm sorry, Mr. Faber, we've been at this about oh. two hours. I think we do need to take a break. This wouldn't just take longer than I thought. So uh, we'll take a break at this time. It's somewhat of a logical stopping place. So we'll take about uh, 15 minutes. So about 3.20, we'll keep plugging away, okay? I'll rise for the exit of the jury, please.
seated, please. Okay, anything before we bring the jury back in, Mr. Favor? No. Mr. Kirk, on? All right, thank you. for the jury please <coughs> all right be seated please okay mr. Faber you can continue with uh, your examination of detective Paul go ahead mm -hmm. I believe we left off. I was asking about um, did you take any efforts to link the number associated with K Man on Marquise Welch's phone with uh, an individual beyond uh, a nickname? I did. Um, <clears throat> I touched on this before, but I, everything on Mr. Welch's phone I put, um, viewed in a, in a timeline mode, so I started at the beginning of the day on the 26th, and anybody that he corresponded with, I would put the phone number in a program we have, um, which will um, give you any data about uh, the person who's registered to that phone number. Um, the phone number for Tay Man came back to uh, Keontae Newberg, so at that point, it, you know, um, he was tentatively ID'd at that point as the person he was talking to just based on um, uh, that the number was registered to him. Can't take him the defendant? That's correct. Okay. Um, did you see, I, I want to direct your attention to, to five specific text messages between Welch and Tayman. Um, did you have a chance to, uh, to look at that as part of your investigation? I did. Related to the big time. Yes. Um, <clears throat> again, at about 4:30 p.m. on uh, the the 26th. So this that would have been um, a little over five hours before um, the incident occurred. There is a conversation between Mr. Welch's phone and Mr. Newburn's phone where they're talking about uh, picking Miss. Where they're discussing picking Mr. Newburn up. Again, that's from, uh, they said the Big Top, which I deduced was the Big Top grocery store. Um, and all of these text messages are time stamped. Uh, I believe there's one where Mr. Welch says I'm here. Uh, I think there's one where Mr. Newburn says I'm cashing out. Right, so, so the one goes on. Your Honor, I move the admission of exhibits 36 to 40, which are these, these text strips. Any objection? No. 36 to 40 are admitted. Tell the jury what we're looking at here. <clears throat> so this is a text um, from uh, Mr. Newburn's phone to Mr. Welch's phone saying about to be outside. I'm sorry, it's the other way around. It's Mr. Welch texting uh, Mr. Newburn saying uh, he's about to be outside. Um, I think there's a previous text to this where they talk about the, that it's the big top. We'll go to uh, exhibit 37 now. Okay, and that, there it is. Um, <clears throat> that is from Mr. Newburn's phone to Mr. Welch's phone telling Mr. Welch to pull up to the, to the big top. That's at 434.43? That's correct. Exhibit 38. 435.22. This is from who to who? 
That is, uh, again, from Mr. Newburn to Mr. Welch's phone, saying uh, that he's essentially about to check out. To the 39. Uh, and that is Mr. Welch. Welch's phone texting Mr. Newburn's phone saying that he's there. At 436.14. And finally at 40. And that is Mr. Newburn responding to Mr. Welch in the affirmative. Okay. Did you have occasion to go to the big top to see if they had interior and exterior surveillance cameras? I did. Uh, <clears throat> Immediately after going through um, Mr. Welch's phone, uh, this stuck out to me as the most likely scenario where I would be able to get surveillance footage showing um, an interaction, because obviously it's in a public place, it's at a grocery store. So uh, I went to the, uh, the Big Top grocery store. All right, we move for the admission Exhibits 28 through 33 video clips from Big Top. Any objection? No, no. 28 through 33 are admitted. And then one final question before we get to the videos, uh, Detective. There was reference in the text message um, uh, from uh, Mr. Newburn indicating he's in the checkout now. At the Big Top, did you uh, take any measures to see if there is a financial record showing a transaction with any credit card associated with Mr. Newbrown? Uh, I, I did not. Um, <clears throat> Detective Romero has the ability to, to check financial transactions. Um, I notified him of, of this um, incident after getting video, but uh, later down the road, um, and, and in this video, you'll see that um, there is somebody at the at the checkout line at the same time that he's that Mr. Newburn's phone is texting Mr. Welch's phone, saying that uh, he's cashing out now. Um, that individual is clearly making a transaction; those records were obtained, uh, and matching up that transaction to the video, um, the, a card that's registered to Mr. Keonti Newburn was used um, during that purchase. We move for the admission of Exhibit 35. Any objection to 35? I want to see it. Sure. Thank you. 35 is admitted. So due, due to some privacy laws, obviously, they, some of this information is redacted, including the card number. Um, <clears throat> but this is essentially the receipt of, of the transaction made. Um, and you can see that bottom transaction at the Big Top Market, um, <clears throat> 3630 Clyde Park Avenue, which is the address of the Big Top, uh, on the 26th at approximately 4.38 PM in the amount of $20.24. And that is with the card registered to Mr. Keontae A. Newberg. Now I'd like to queue up uh, to the 29, please. Oh, uh, pause it there. For people not familiar. 
familiar with military time. I know the police department uses military time. Uh, 16, 29, 15 would be what in civilian parlance? That'd be uh, 4.29 p.m. Okay, so, so time of 4.31.50 or 16.31.50. We can pause it there. Um, as, you, as you look at anybody in line, does anybody stand out to you? So this was the first video that I saw because uh, I had the, bank, the the store manager go to the timestamp um, of the text messages, uh, the conversation, and this was essentially the first clip that I saw. I immediately recognized the individual on the right at 1631. On the right, standing in this checkout line, because of this distinct coat that is dark on top and white on the bottom. Um, this, again, this is about a little over five hours before the shooting incident um, occurred. <clears throat> and we were looking for an individual <coughs> with this coat. So you can see um, <clears throat> the individual in the distinct coat is very clearly texting or doing something on his phone at that time. Yeah, so it appears that uh, he is having a conversation with somebody. I don't know if the big top video is synced with cell phone, you know, atomic time or whatever, but uh, does that roughly correspond with the timing of the text messages? It's within a few minutes, yes. Now if we can fast forward to 4.35. It was. That is the transaction um, <clears throat> that we obtained the, the data for, um, showing the card registered to Mr. Duber.
Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to <laughs> pause it or not. Awkward moment there. So, <clears throat> obviously, he's very far away here, but with that coat on, he's very distinct. Um, again, dark on top, white on the bottom, two tone jacket. Now, cue up uh, to the 30. Go to 4. <coughs> Are these registers from another camera angle? It is, yeah. This, um, <clears throat> so the register the registers are over here, obviously, on the left side of the camera angle, and then this would be the. F anyway, um, where the where the gentleman in the well, now he disappeared. Kind of by the guy in the black coat. That's the exit door that goes out into the parking lot that faces north. On the right side of the screen? That's correct. So at 163452, you, uh, you see that individual? This is uh, having some problems, but yes, he's on the, on the left side of, of, of the video there. Again, distinct. Basically, basically on the left side under the... 22 of Essentially, like skinny jeans, faded, um, like acid wash is the term. Those are, um, I'm not too familiar with the hip clothing, but I think that's the term for them. Objection of 34. 34 is admitted. Basically, a screenshot of uh, this individual at the register. That's correct. That's, I believe that's from the first camera angle we watched from inside the big top. Now, moving to, <clears throat> did, did you have occasion to look at the exterior cameras? I did. Did you see this individual uh, corresponding in time exiting the store as we saw him going from inside? You do. Um, where Luckily, at, where does he go? <clears throat> so at this at this time of the day, four thirty. <laughs> luckily, it's still light out, um, so the cameras aren't in night vision mode. You can um, discern colors, those types of things. Um, <clears throat> there's a camera on the um, far west of the building that faces kind of northeast through the parking lot. Immediately after this individual leaves uh, the big top, he goes out to the parking lot. And again, you can see the distinct Silver Dodge Journey that uh, belongs to Mr. Welch pulled into the parking lot. Um, <clears throat> that vehicle goes to the east side of the parking lot, um, stops, and um, the individual in the two-tone jacket here walks to that vehicle, gets in the, the passenger side door, and they leave the lot. So I'll play uh, <coughs> 31. Exhibit 31 and 32 are very short clips. So again, this is the parking lot of the big top. So pause it there and we'll hit play it. Um, at, at which angle would you see this individual, or from what exit would you see this individual leaving? Or, well, actually, we'll hit play and you tell me if you see him. Okay. So that is the front door right there, and you can see dark on top, white on bottom, jacket. Um, 
he's walking over to the the Silver Dodge Journey that's waiting for him over there. Um, I'm not sure if it's in a previous clip or not, but you can see the Dodge Journey pull into the into the lot just prior to that. And, and for the record, you're indicating the person that was walking from the right out of the store and then heading uh, toward toward the vehicle on the right side. That's correct. You go 32. So here is that the Silver Dodge Journey uh, stopped right there. So again, <clears throat> Silver Dodge Journey, this would be the driver's side door with the heavy damage. Um, and it is very, I mean, it's a kind of a peculiar shape, but um, we can match that then to the Dodge Journey that we had at, at this time now in our custody. Um, and, and it was comparable. I have one final question for you. The Prior witness, you weren't in the courtroom, but uh, Officer Darian Adams was one of the canvassers, uniformed officers. She referenced in her testimony that she was canvassing the north side, and she was talking about uh, 23 Canton. She also referenced a uh, potential video from 20 Canton, which would be on the south side. Uh, what, if any, uh, video of evidentiary value was obtained from that address? So there's 70, uh, I'm sorry, several homes on Canton that had video systems. Um, there's several homes in this neighborhood with video systems. The unfortunate thing is not all, not all of them work and not all of them are real. Um, we found there was a couple instances of that. There was a house across the street from 47 Canton that had cameras that didn't even work. Um, I think it was 20 Canton also had cameras, um, but they didn't record, I believe was the scenario. Um, several of those were checked by the, initially by officers um, that, that conducted that initial canvas. Um, and then if need be, they were recontacted. But um, on Canton, the only video that we were able to obtain um, and that was useful was from 23 Canton and then of course, um, the business at Canton Division and then at, at uh, Hall and Division again. No further questions. Ms. Kirkhoff, any questions for Detective Hall? The video from 23 Canton only shows an individual running down the street, correct? No, sir. No? Uh, there's there's a lone individual that runs on the uh, on the north sidewalk eastbound, right. not in not in the street though. That does okay. I'm sorry. It does not show that individual at 47 Canton, does it? No, the the camera at 23 Canton, as you guys saw, was not directed uh, towards 47 well, there's Canton. There's no way you can say this is the person that was that shot up 47 Canton. That is not on view in the camera though. No. And people have a tendency to run from shots being fired, don't they? That's accurate, yes. Okay. I have no further questions. Anything else, Mr. Faber? Okay, Detective Paul, you're excused. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, next witness, please. I think, Your Honor, the people call Officer Brandon Romero.
Good afternoon, sir. Please raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you got it. Very good. Have a seat, please. Go ahead, Mr. Prevent. Thank you, Your Honor. And if I may state to the court um, and the jury that this witness is also slightly out of order, but. Uh, Trying to sorry. accommodate schedules. That's okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name and also spell it for the record? My name is Brandon Romero. First name spelling B R A N D O N. Last name is R O M E R O. Thank you. How are you currently employed? With the Grand Rapids Police Department. What is your current assignment? I am currently assigned to the major case detective unit. And can you please describe for the jury what that means or what types of cases you generally investigate? So type of cases I generally investigate are violent felonies specific to murder, robberies, any weapon related offenses, uh, suspicious deaths. How long have you been with the Grand Rapids Police Department? I've been employed with the Grand Rapids Police Department since December of 2017. And did you have prior experience as an officer before that? Yes, I did. I did approximately five and a half years with the Mason County Sheriff's Office in Lettington, Michigan. Did you have some involvement in the case for which we're here in court? Yes. When did you first become involved? I would say early uh, January of 2022. Would that have been uh, 2023? Sorry, 2023. January 2023, you first become involved in this incident? Yes. Can you please describe for the jury what your primary role in this investigation was? So at the time of this investigation, I was assigned to the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. Um, with that being said, I was requested uh, by detectives to assist them in this investigation, uh, specifically to locate uh, Mr. Newbern. So at that point in time, uh, was Keontae Newbern named as a possible suspect in this case? Yes. And as a result of that, did you attempt to locate him? I did. Were you able to locate him? I was. How did you do that? Uh, so throughout this investigation, we were able to confirm his cell phone number specifically belonging to Mr. Newburn uh, through several investigative means. Uh, with that being said, I was able to confirm that it was serviced by T-Mobile. Um, from there, I uh, drafted a search warrant to receive call detailed record information to include cell site location information, also known as pings for you know, layman's terms. Um, I drafted that search warrant and it was ultimately signed on January 5th of 2023. And after that search warrant was signed, did you get regular updates from that phone ping? Yeah, so once it's served to the carrier, um, it could be anywhere from, I would say 20 minutes to hours to a day or two before the provider starts to provide the information to us when it comes to the cell site location information. So therefore I do start receiving notifications from T-Mobile every 15 minutes, um, giving me an accuracy of where that phone may be at. And as a result of that information, were you able to <coughs> locate the defendant? Yes. Where did you locate him at? I located him at 1013 Climax Street within the city of Lansing. Was that his uh, regular registered address? No. Do you know what his last known registered address was? Uh, I believe it was in the 600 block of 36th Street Southwest, possibly 644, I believe it was. Is that in the city of Grand Rapids? No, it's in the city of Wyoming. In the city of Wyoming. But you located him in Lansing? That's correct. Uh, do you, was that in a house, an apartment, or something else? It was a house. Do you know whose house that was? Yes, yeah, so through the investigation, I was able to determine that, that residence belonging to, or being owned by his grandmother. And furthermore, a an additional family member had been residing there um, and I was able to uh, physically see a, a, a vehicle in the driveway that came back registered to the, the family member. So what is the first date that you actually um, observed the defendant at that address in Lansing? That would have been on January 10th, 2023. After you observed the defendant at that address in Lansing, what did you do next? So once I observed him there, uh, there was conversation with the investigators lead, the lead investigators on this investigation on to how we were going to proceed next. Ultimately, a search warrant was drafted for the residence of 1013 Climax Street in Lansing, and the execution was, uh, was done by the Michigan State Police. Uh, were you involved in that search? Uh, yes, I was. Were numerous officers involved in that? Yes. During this case? Uh, yes. Uh, can you please describe what those items were as it relates to the defendant? 
So specifically, um, once the house was secured by the tactical team, um, investigators uh, moved into the house to conduct a search. I specifically uh, conducted a search along with uh, Sergeant Keith Hefner and Detective uh, Noxum on the second floor of the residence. Uh, it was a very large room, um, extremely cluttered, and within that room, I located a uh, Michigan ID that was kind of up on the, uh, it's like a railing above, like the headboard of a bed. Um, that ID was kind of in like a hand wallet, and it was uh, the ID of Keontae Newburn. Uh, with that also said was a cell phone nearby resting on top of the bed. Um, I believe there was some clothing that uh, Detective Sergeant Hefner and others had located uh, with some interest. It wasn't me directly. And then furthermore, I was also notified by Detective Noxum that he had located an additional two phones, I believe, in an adjacent bedroom that appeared to belong to a child. And was one phone taken or seized that appeared to belong to the defendant? Yes. And was that collected as evidence? Yes, it was. Um, was that collected and turned over for later, a later forensic download of that phone? Yes. Any objection? No. All right, very good. 48 through 49F are admitted. Thank you. Um, so first I will show you Officer Romero, People's Exhibit 49A. Do you recognize what is shown here? I do. And what is that? And that is the identification card belonging to County Newburn. Is that a photograph of the location where you found it? Yes. And is that at the house um, in Lansing? Correct. Um, and that's the 49B. And what is shown here in 49B? Just a kind of a, the same photo, but stepping back a little ways towards like the, the foot area of the bed, back down towards the area in which I found the uh, ID. How about 49C? It's an overall photo. Um, from you know afar, I guess you could say, uh, kind of just showing the overlooked area of what the bedroom looked like. And how many stories or floors uh, were at that house? I I don't I, I believe three, but I I, I can't I, I don't recall. I just remember going upstairs, and I specifically uh, concentrated on this room. Uh, this is the main room that you searched. That's correct. And how about forty nine D? Is that just another view of that same room showing the area where you located the ID? That's correct. And 49E? That's going to be the exterior of 1013 Climax from the road. And 49F. What is shown there? That's going to be the phone. Uh, the, well, there's two there, but the specific phone uh, that's not lit up, I guess you could say, could be the one that was identified being uh, Mr. Newburn's that was located in the uh, children's bedroom. It was located in a, um, a child's bedroom? Yes. Uh, was that the room where the defendant had been staying? Uh, no. no. Not, not to my knowledge. It did not have any of his belongings in there that I, that I was told or that I saw. And so the phone that we see in this photograph on the right-hand side that you indicated is kind of illuminated or lit up, um, that was not the phone associated with the defendant? No. Um, it's the phone that we see in the middle of this picture. Is that correct? Yes. And I'm going to show you what's been admitted as People's Exhibit 48 and 49. Um, if you could just open those and let me know if you recognize them. And there's um, gloves there if you want them. So here's a black, or it's actually bluer, an iPhone with a black cover on it. Um, this to be the one that's non-illuminated. Um, is that the actual phone that we see in the photograph up here in 49F? That's correct. Uh, and what you're holding in your hand, that's just for the record, that's people's exhibit 48. And that's 
So here in this exhibit, I have the wallet as previous showed, um, showing the identification card of Keontae Newburn. Um, I also have a social security card, again in the name of Keontae Andrew Michael Newburn. And then also a certificate of live birth for uh, Keontae Newburn. And did you locate all of those items at the search uh, of the Lansing House? Yes, they were. <clears throat> And do you recall the name of the other family member that you referenced that had been staying there? Markela, I believe. Was that Markela Newberg Bonds? Yes. And do you know what the relation was to the defendant? I think it was a cousin, I believe, if I remember right. I, I know that during the search of the, uh, the address in itself, the connection was a grandmother as ownership of the home. Kirk, off any questions? No questions. Okay, you're excused. Thank, Thank you very you much, much, sir. <clears throat> okay, it's so my understanding we have a final witness. Yes. All yes. right, for the day, not for the <laughs> trial. Just letting you know, one final witness for the day. I'll see you tomorrow. Quick restroom break. Okay, why don't we have just a very short, like five minute break. Stacy will let you know when we're ready to go back to get back in the record, but uh, well, we're gonna wait for our final witness here, okay? I'll rise to the next of the jury, please. Okay, be seated. Um, anything else on the record in favor? Nothing from the people, Your Honor. Anything on the record at this time, Mr. Gurkha? Oh, yeah. right, let's keep it short, though. All right, thank you.
Shaila, how do you spell your first and last name, please? S H E I L A. Oh, sorry, Sheila Bro. S H E I L A B R O W. And what is your occupation now? I work for uh, Grand Rapids Police Department as a crime scene technician in the Forensic Services Unit. How long have you performed that job? Approximately 26 years. Is retirement looming? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to direct your attention back to late December of 2022. You were working in that capacity as a crime scene technician? Yes, that is correct. Did you become involved in the investigation of a homicide that occurred at uh, 47th Hampton Street Southwest? Yes. What, uh, what, two questions, what was your role and when did you first become involved? The detectives asked me to process a vehicle that was transported to our garage at the police department. And so I processed that vehicle and then I also collected some clothing and um, items from the autopsy. The autopsy of, uh, of, the, of the victim, yes. Okay. Uh, which happened first? The autopsy. And you remember what day that was? On the 27th of December. Okay, so a day after the, the her, her, of uh, the lunch. incident, yes. And did you ever go to 47 Canton yourself? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, so what did you collect, and, and was this at uh, Blodgett, uh, Butterworth? Uh, at Blodgett, yes, Blodgett. 1840 Wealthy, Southeast. And now, now it's Corwell Health, but Spectrum? Yeah, Corwell Health. Okay. And what did you collect uh, that had evidentiary value in terms of this case? So what we collect is everything um, that they collect from the victim. So they take the photographs, so I collect the photographs from them, and I collect all the, the clothing, the personal belongings, and um, finger, um, fingernail clippings and um, any evidence they retrieve once they do their post-mortem examination. Okay, and so clothing, jewelry, were those standard items taken from? Yes, anything that sh the deceased has on their person when they're transported to go to the morgue. Did medical personnel find any uh, weapons of any kind that you collected? No. <clears throat> In terms of the, either the external or internal examinations done during the autopsy, was any item of evidentiary value collected from the, the person of Ms. Kelly? Yes. What was that? A projectile. And you, you collected that personally in any place that had evidence? Yes. And I would move to the admission of Exhibit 59. Thank you. 59 is admitted. May I yes. Ms. Burrow, uh, take a moment to look at the envelope here. So, yeah, this is our evidence envelope. We have barcodes and it has the incident number and the address and my name and, and the description, the projectile from, <coughs> I believe the projectile from head. Okay, and that, there's a biohazard sticker. Uh, what, what's the significance of that? Biohazard, because it obviously would be biohazard because it came from a human head. Okay, but that's the projectile that was recovered from uh, Miss uh, Miss Kelly. Kelly, yes. You can just set that down with the biohazard sticker. I won't ask you this. So. Now, moving on, you you mentioned that you were asked by detectives to process a vehicle that was in cust police custody? Yes. What detectives requested that of you? Um, Detective Wolf and Detective Bayless. And what vehicle specifically was the focus of this uh, request? Um, and if I look at your report, would refresh your memory? Yeah, that was a Dodge Journey. Uh, was there, do you have a license plate number that's associated with the vehicle that was in police custody? Yes, it was um, a Michigan plate EXP 9524. And I have a move for the admission of exhibits 56 through 58. Any objection? No. 56, 57, and 58 are admitted. Showing 56 
six on the wall. That's the that's the vehicle that you processed. Yes, and it's located in our we call it our forensics garage. It's just a small garage inside the Grand Rapids Police Department downtown. And is this the driver or the passenger side? It's the front passenger door. Showing some damage. Yes. Right, 57. And, what angle what are we looking at? And that's just more overall showing the the hood and the driver's side and showing the like, damage in the driver door area. Did the driver door open? It did not. And I shot 58. And then an overall view of more of the passenger side and showing some damage on that front passenger door. Did you uh, do a thorough search of the interior of the vehicle? Yes. Uh, what, if anything, did you find? Uh, the only thing I found were some cell phones on the front passenger seat. And were those uh, given to detectives for further he, investigation? Yeah, I marked them as evidence and submitted them to our mobile device analysis unit. Was there any finger, uh, are you qualified to, uh, to, to obtain or lift uh, latent fingerprints? I did um, process the vehicle for possible latent fingerprints. I did not find any on the vehicle. Not a single fingerprint? No. Is, is, that, un, is that unusual? No, it is, it is not. And, it, and especially in winter time, it's not that unusual to, find, to not find fingerprints. It was, you know, I mean, I'm not picking on the vehicle, but it was a little dirty and like in winter when you have the salt and dirt residue, it, it was not that unusual not to find a fingerprint on the vehicle. Kirk, off any questions? No questions. Ms. Bro, you are excused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, thank you for your attention today. We got through the opening instructions, opening statements, 13 witnesses. That's quite a bit. So we made good progress. We are on schedule, right, counsel? Yes, Your Honor. All right, very good. So um, we'll see you tomorrow by 8.15. You guys are great. I know everyone is up here before 8.30. Uh, please be prompt like you were uh, today. I appreciate it. Uh, just a reminder, do not review any publicity uh, or TV reports or anything on the internet regarding uh, this case. No internet research. Don't go to the scene. Do not talk to anyone. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. All rise for the exit of the jury, please. All right, be seated, please. Um, we can do this on or off the record, it doesn't really matter. Um, judges always think lawyers do too, take too long to do stuff, no matter what it happens, really. <laughs> no, no offense to anybody. I think uh, the prosecution's done very well uh, moving the case along. I think Mr. Kirkhouse has been very accommodating as well. I appreciate that. Would it be too ambitious to think we could possibly get the evidence done tomorrow? Um, is that possible that we could line up those witnesses? I'm looking at, we get, did get 13 witnesses done today. I would think, you know, Mr. Welch will be a while. Uh, I don't know about some of these other people. You know, I just don't know whether a witness like uh, uh, Detective uh, Hall, it took a long time and then this bro took like five minutes. So um, I'm just wondering if that's even possible. If it's not, that's fine. But. It also would help counsel, I think, because then all the evidence is in by tomorrow, and then they can prepare uh, closing arguments for Thursday. Um, any, any thoughts on that, Mr. Faber? I, I think it's I think it's possible to get to all but one witness, Your Honor, and not because of time, but because former Detective Thomas Heikola is unavailable tomorrow. And okay. For first and time. he's he's the cell phone guy, right? It, it won't be terribly long testimony, okay. but. Uh, that would have to come in Thursday morning. Okay, that's fine. Um, I just want to, if you think uh, we're moving along well, maybe we can get in uh, Dr. Start in the uh, afternoon as well as uh, Detective Wolf. 
Uh, but we'll see how it goes. If we don't get it all done tomorrow or, or other than hike, oh, that's fine. I just want to put that bug in people's ear in case we could get that far. That'd be great. If we can't, that's okay, too. Okay, anything else on the record from the prosecution? No, Your Honor. Anything from you, Mr. Gerkoff? No. Great. See you bright and early tomorrow and see if we can get some real progress done tomorrow. You guys are great today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.